And we are live. Let me see if I can uh, get my little countdown timer working. Hey, 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 hey. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the live stream. We're going to get started here in about three minutes. And I think today, instead of noodling on my guitar, which is very out of tune right now, I'm guessing y'all don't want me to tune my guitar on stream. Uh, I'm going to do a little Q&A while we wait for people to sort of trickle in. So, hey, welcome to the stream. Let me know where you're from. Let me know what you're working on in the chat. I'll be there for the first uh, few minutes of the stream, and then I'll be kicking things off with a whole bunch of great content that I have planned for you today. I wrote out an outline. I feel like a proper teacher. I wrote out an actual outline for this stream. So, hey, we got somebody from Minneapolis. Awesome. Somebody from uh, UK. Is it Lewis or Luz? Not sure how you pronounce that. Poland. I think um, my director of support, Alex, will be in the stream. He's also in Poland. <laughs> Chris says he has his guitar already. He's going to jam along too. Maybe at some point we need to do a jam stream. I don't know how you would do that with the latency. Maybe you can get the latency perfect, right? So like, okay, if you can get the latency exactly one quarter note, then the drummer could play one quarter note ahead of time <laughs> and you would get, and you would get an actual, uh, an actual song out of it. So yeah, sorry for everyone who comes for the guitar at some point. I'll, let me show you. I'll literally show you actually. I brought, I brought this gigantic switchboard <laughs> because what i want to do what i want to do is is use the streams the three minute countdown at the beginning of the streams as like an excuse to do music performances <laughs> so i'm gonna figure that eventually i haven't had time this week this has been an insane week uh we have had you know tons of work going on for prepping for the stream for videos we're working on there's a new Notion feature coming out next week. Um, it was supposed to come out yesterday and <laughs> it didn't come out yesterday. So we were scrambling to film a video. We got it filmed. Uh, I might be able to actually give you a sneak peek, a little teaser at that new feature in this stream. They did give me um, permission to show it. So to, to a small degree, I told them there would only be, you know, maybe a couple of hundred people in the stream and we'll see if we even get that. This is maybe even more niche than last week. Last week we did um, Notion formulas for beginners. The first week we did building a note-taking system. Uh, but this week we're doing Notion for teams. So yeah, checking the chat one more time. We got 10 seconds left. Josh says, trying to break $2,000 revenue from music. I'll get there eventually. Um, I'd love to know, Josh, are you also at $2,000 revenue from music? Cause that would be pretty sweet. It takes a while to get there. It takes quite a while to get there, I do have to say. All right, I'm going to transition my little starting soon thing off of the screen. Um, is it C-Mom, C-Moon? I got more videos coming on the main channel. We are working on, uh, you know, between streaming here, between making uh, long-form videos on TF Explains, product design and updates and meetings and CEO stuff, it is uh, quite a lot of work on my plate right now, but we do have new main channel videos in the works. And at some point in the future, I also want to do like a notion for content creators stream where I'll probably show off a lot more of the behind the scenes of how we plan content and get it made. Um, but what we're going to do in this video in this stream is go over the absolute basics of how to start leveraging notion with a team, ideally a small team. If you're uh, here and you're representing like a 1000 person company and you're trying to get them all on notion, um, <laughs> this stream might be a little bit basic, but I'm trying to keep things basic because I want to, I want to show people a way to start using notion with a team that is going to actually stick. It's going to get buy-in from the team. That's going to be a net positive instead of being something confusing. So uh, we have IFTTT in the chat. That's pretty cool. Um, I have some other questions. So yeah, uh, like always, Marissa is going to be collecting the questions that I'll be answering during question and answer breaks. Um, if you're new here, the way I run streams is more like a teacher than a regular live streamer. I don't sit here and react to content. I actually sort of plan out lesson content and then go through it. So what you're going to see in this stream is an actual kind of lesson that I've planned out. In fact, let me just trans uh, transition over to my little lesson plan here. I actually planned it out. 
So let me give you an overview of what we're going to be doing in this stream. Um, I also wanna make sure I can see my Slack here just in case I'm doing something stupid and my team wants to call it out because I sometimes do that. <laughs> okay, so what we're gonna go through in this stream. Uh, first, we're gonna go through a bit of an intro. Uh, I've kind of outlined a sort of goal for this stream here. I wanna show you the first steps toward getting your team on Notion in a way that is easy for everyone involved, that involves a little friction and uh, that will also work long-term because a lot of teams will get into Notion and maybe they have one person like me on the team who is extremely excited about Notion. They go super into the weeds. They're very nerdy about it, but then they're like building these really, really advanced workflows. The rest of the team doesn't really understand and there's never a lot of buy-in. So we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, we're also going to show some best practices for maintaining a great workspace. And then uh, part of this stream is literally going to be me building what I'm going to show you on stream. So I'm going to show you some stuff I've pre-built. You can hang out for the first hour or so to sort of get the overview. We're going to be mapping some stuff out, talking about theory and practice. And then after the first hour or so, uh, we'll actually be building that stuff. And then as always, this stream is going to be live on the channel as an archive. I'll show you that really quickly, actually, over on the TF Explains channel. There's a little live tab right here and all of my stream archives are here. So my sort of content plan right now with the channel, and we'll see how this works in the future, uh, is to do these streams, which so far are going around two and a half to three hours, um, to make them like the most in-depth training possible along with Q&A and stuff like that. And then over on the videos tab, I'll take uh, stuff from the streams that we cover, condense them down into shorter, more meaty, impactful videos, and um, they should be under an hour, hopefully. So. Basically, I'm trying to give people as much of a choice as possible. Do you want to hang out in the stream or, or catch the archive and see the really, really slow, like no detail skipped version of something? Or do you want to see our highly produced, um, you know, slicker and a bit more summarized version? That's what you'll see in the videos tab. So going back to our little lesson plan here, we're going to start with the top three rules, I think, that you should follow for using Notion successfully with a team. Uh, and... They're right here, start small and get a buy-in, keep everyone on the same page and set permissions intelligently. We'll go over those a bit more in detail after I go through this outline. We're gonna go through a team workspace overview and you can kind of see these pages in the sidebar here. We're gonna go through level one, which I think everyone should start with the team, which is the basic company wiki. Then we'll go through level two, a meeting notes database. Level three is a company wiki that I'm going to call an advanced company wiki. It will look fairly similar, but it'll be a bit more functional um, and take a little bit more setup to get right. And then level four is gonna be task and project management. I'm putting that at level four because I don't think every team in the world should be doing task and project management in Notion. I know teams that do it really, really well, including my own. Um, but then again, you might have bigger teams or engineering teams with a lot of extra uh, requirements and needs and maybe Notion isn't the right fit for them. So that's why that's level four. We're going to start doing some mapping out of um, company organization and communication, not just in Notion, but we're going to talk about some helper apps, companion apps that you can use to sort of build a whole suite out. Um, a lot of this is going to be inspired by my ops director's work, Marissa Goldberg. Uh, she works with us and she has sort of helped to overhaul our own company ops and comms. So we'll be talking about Slack strategy, Notion strategy, and a few other helper apps that we use to get things done as a team. We'll talk a little bit about permissions in team spaces. This probably won't be the most in-depth stream ever on permissions in team spaces. Um, somebody on my team was telling me today that I could probably do an entire stream on those alone, and maybe I will at some point. And then we're gonna go into a build with me section. So I'm gonna put that at the end. We're literally gonna build these three, I think, yeah, probably three pages from scratch. Uh, but I want to show you how they work first because I have a lot of additional content on the channel on building in Notion. And maybe you already know how to use the actual building blocks of databases and filters and, and uh, pages and stuff like that. So let's just go ahead and get into it. I'm going to switch back over here really quickly. And I want to talk about the top three rules for using Notion with your team. And this comes from a lot of experience we've had with our own team. And I think as part of this section of the presentation, I'll talk about how my team actually got into Notion and the first steps that we took, uh, the first things, the first pages and dashboards we found especially useful. So the main thing with Notion is it's kind of like Legos, right? You have like a box of digital Legos and you can build whatever you want. So when you're working with a team, you don't have the luxury of understanding everything that you've done in the past and being able to tinker and kind of know the history of it because you now have a team and you have to communicate with them. So the most important thing is when you're working with a team, say you're a Notion nerd, you're like me, you've built stuff like Ultimate Tasks, Ultimate Brain, you're doing like recurring tasks and um, all sorts of advanced workflows in Notion. That's not where you want to start with a team. 
because you want to get buy-in. You want to get uh, people on board with switching to a new tool and having run a company for over 10 years, a company with team members and employees for over five at this point, we've gone through several different types of software that we've tried to adopt. And this can be a major pitfall. If you just get super excited about a new tool, it doesn't have to be Notion. In the past, it's been Asana or ClickUp for us. Uh, and I go like head first into it. And then I tell the team, hey, I built this giant setup in ClickUp, we're gonna use this. Or I built this giant setup in Asana, we're gonna use this. If the team doesn't buy into it, if the team feels overwhelmed, then they're just gonna go back to using whatever else is at hand, which might be just putting tasks on their desktop in a sticky note or putting tasks in Slack. And that's what you don't want. You wanna build a system that people are bought into so they actually use it and you have an agreed upon centralized place for uh, company information, for meeting notes, for tasks and projects, whatever it is, you wanna make sure the team's on the same page. So rule number one, start small, talk with your team, communicate with them and get buy-in on it. Rule number two, keep everyone on the same page. So this was one, um, my head of support, Alex, is also a Notion consultant and he's built out workspaces and done, co and done coaching for companies. Uh, a big thing that he says you want to avoid is having sort of sub teams on your team build out these silos of information that only they know how to navigate and only they know how to work with. So you might have a team of 10 people like we do, and you might have like a support team and a dev team and a marketing team. Now they could have their own spaces, they could have their own team spaces, but if you have them sort of doing their own thing over here and there's no procedures set out for how information is supposed to be structured, then you're gonna run into problems when it comes time to onboard new people, or maybe you have somebody from a different part of your team who's now going to go help that team. They don't know how to do things. There should be some sort of agreed upon structure of information. Even if things look a little bit different from place to place, you wanna have an agreed upon structure. And you, again, you wanna be on the same page. Uh, and then last but not least, we're gonna talk about this a lot more in the stream. You wanna set permissions intelligently. Again, Notion is like digital Legos. It kind of lets you do whatever you want. And by default, it might give people on your team too much permission when they don't need it. And especially when they don't uh, always know exactly how Notion works. So a great example would be you give full access permission to everything to everyone on the team, and you have somebody who doesn't quite know how Notion works, maybe they accidentally delete some properties in a database. Like maybe you have a database full of um, videos that are gonna go out on your channel and you have like a sponsorship rate property for uh, for each video. Somebody on your team could accidentally delete that property while trying to hide it and then it could be gone. So you want to intelligently set permissions and ideally have one or two people in the company whose job it is to maintain the notion. They should have full permissions and then everyone else should just have the permissions they need to do the work that they need to do. Okay, so we're gonna keep those in mind and then we're gonna go into now uh, actually looking over the different workspace pages that we're gonna build here. So basically what I've prepared for you today is a really simple workspace that can work really well for a small team, maybe you know five to 10 to 15 people. Um, and I think even for a bigger team, some of these some of these different things could work really well as well. So we're keeping things intentionally simple. We're gonna be talking about a company wiki, a meeting notes database, and then task and project management. Um, so when I say company wiki simple, what I mean is something like this. We just have a simple page, and actually this is the wrong one, this is the advanced one, I wanna look at the basic one. We have a simple page that has a couple of different sections for different areas in the company, like business administration, customer service, tech reference, and all you do here is create pages for documentation. And what you're documenting is processes, uh, standard operating procedures, uh, reference information, basically any kind of thing that somebody on your team needs to reference often. If there's a process that people on your team need to go through, you wanna get your team sort of documenting those processes in a centralized knowledge base like this. As your company grows, or if you already have a large company, you could also have team specific knowledge bases like a development or engineering knowledge base and a marketing knowledge base. But a great way to start, especially if you're working with a smaller team, is to make one knowledge base page and then just have sections for uh, kind of organizing the articles based on their uh, their purpose in the company and their department as it were. And uh, we have 11 people on our team actually. This is what we use. We don't yet have separated out team spaces. We have a single knowledge base page, and then we have sections just like this, and you can actually go into those sections. Now I'm gonna switch over really quickly to my advanced knowledge base. This is level three, but, um, but I wanna show it to you because I've actually prepared some sample content in here. So basically what you would wanna do is start creating 
a, a kind of template for process documents that you want to create. So I've done that for this reference article right here because I already had it written. And basically what I've done here is I've noted who created it. If I want to have somebody as the maintainer of this document, I can just set them as the maintainer. I'm going to set myself really quickly. And then you can see we have a section here, technical reference. Uh, and then within here, basically, if I was giving a job to somebody else on my team, like, hey, we have all of these, what is this article really quickly? Uh, we have all these video files and I want you to, com you want, I want you to convert them to audio so we can say, transcribe them to text, summarize them, whatever it is. Uh, if I wanted to give that job to somebody on my team, I can't, um, I can't assume they know exactly how to do it. So I want to write up a document that would teach them how to do it and answer any questions. So I have a table of contents here. I have a summary and I have action steps. These are actually AI generated. I'm going to show you uh, kind of how that works a little bit later in the stream. But the main thing here is I just have a full article that I've written up and I kind of have the prerequisites. I have an installation here uh, for installing Homebrew. I have the actual commands for navigating to a directory and the actual command for converting a file uh, and an explanation as well. So I would say that this is an example of idealized documentation. Um, don't feel bad if all of your documents don't look like this. This is the ideal, in my opinion. You basically have a summary, you have action steps so people can easily reference exactly what they need to do and see it very quickly. And then you have a full explanation for everything. That way, if somebody is looking through the action steps and, and gets confused or doesn't understand something, there should be an explanation down here that they can reference. Um, so the whole, the whole idea here is you're taking a little bit of time up front, you're investing and you get these documents that then can be referenced again and again and again by people on your team. And as your team grows, especially as you onboard new people who might not know how to do things, you don't have to repeat yourself or to like search and dig through Slack conversations to try to find stuff you already wrote up. You know exactly where that process documentation is. And crucially, everyone else in your company knows exactly where it is as well. Um, I might be able to show you that new Notion feature that's coming out because it's actually quite relevant to this. So we'll see. Um, it might not work because it takes a little bit of time to index things, but wow, that was a loud motorcycle right there. Uh, <laughs> so to give you a little bit of a teaser, because this is something that's coming out next week, uh, Notion AI has a new feature called Q&A, and I think I have it in this workspace right here. Yep, it's basically a chat bot right inside of Notion, and uh, it works a bit like ChatGPT, except for the fact that it only searches your Notion content. So you won't be able to ask it like, hey, what's the unladen airspeed velocity of a swallow or something like that, uh, unless you had written that in there. It's not gonna go out and actually find information on the web, or uh, it's not gonna like reference a public training set, but it does reference all your documents. Documents. So if I said something like, uh, how can I convert a audio file or video file to an audio file? And forgive my typing speed today. This office is quite cold. Uh, we'll see if it's indexed it. It might not have. Okay, so it hasn't indexed it yet. But basically, uh, I've tested this out over the past week or so. Once the article gets indexed, and I just threw this in here like 20 minutes ago in prep for the streams. So that's why it's not here. It would actually create a very concise um, summary of the process based on the question I ask. And the coolest thing is it will actually link to its sources. It cites its sources and links to the relevant pages. So again, if you're running a team, this I think is an incredibly useful feature. Um, and I might be able to actually bring it up in a full window because I think my face is covering it right now. Uh, yeah, here it is. I think this would be a super useful feature for teams because again, as your team scales, even if you have a super nicely uh, organized whole workspace just like this, they're not always going to know exactly where to find things. So the better we have for um, the better tools we have for searching and sort of conversationally asking questions, the more efficient your team is going to be. Okay, I'm going to quickly check my back channel really quickly just to make sure. Cool. That's just questions that Marissa's collecting. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So I showed you that converting audio files. Uh, sort of documentation there. Another uh, really, really useful trick that I find is uh, using a tool called Loom. And I think I have, I think I have something in here. Here it is, Tasking Projects Guide. So Loom is one of the sort of helper apps we're gonna go through later on in the stream. Uh, I also find this incredibly helpful for building documentation. Uh, and I actually find it even better than writing sometimes because I can talk out a process and show it on my computer way faster than I can write it. So uh, we actually pay for Loom as a team. And what actually put me onto Loom is when I got into Notion, I realized there was a Loom embed block and you can literally 
take a video with Loom, you get the URL on your clipboard immediately after you stop filming and you can paste it and have it in Notion in like 10 seconds. So just like this, I've created a useful piece of documentation that is video based uh, and Loom has a really fast transcription algorithm. So beneath my summary and my action steps, I just pasted the entire transcript from Loom like this. And then I hit these little summary buttons that I'll show you later. And it just takes the transcript from Loom, creates action steps, creates a summary. And within maybe five minutes, I have a really useful piece of documentation in which uh, three of those five minutes were spent filming the little uh, Loom video. So this is actually one of my biggest tips here to start building out process documentation for your team. Seriously use Loom because as you use Loom, you'll be able to just sort of talk through what you're doing. You get to show it. And that creates that super useful context for your team where they get to see everything you're doing. There's no ambiguity. And then we can use tools like AI to create a summary almost instantly. Or if you want, you could create your summary yourself. But again, it's all about creating that perfect context for your team. So you're not going back and forth asking tons and tons of questions or, or answering tons and tons of questions for your team. And then uh, one other thing I'll show you here is you can put databases inside pages. So another really useful thing we do with our company is we have a gear and tool section and we maintain databases for things like uh, apps that we're using. Um, since we're a media production company, we will often save songs for videos from um, like royalty free stock music sites that we really like. Uh, we have a gear list as well. So you can just open that up and we could see we have software licenses which are all fake here, uh, for the actual tools that we use. So Alfred Powerpack, Screen Studio, Descript, we all we use all these tools as a team. So often somebody on the team gets a new computer. They're like, hey, I need a license for um, Mac Whisper or whatever it is. Boom, it's in our Notion. Again, they don't have to ask the question. They can just go to our knowledge base and they get that information almost instantly. So that, my friends, is sort of level one and, and I guess level three uh, because we kind of went into the level three version. Um, going back to my little team stream here, I wanna check out the outline. Actually, then I think I wanna keep this outline in this tab here, so I'll switch over. Level two is a meeting notes database. So I personally find Notion to be an excellent note-taking tool. Uh, the experience of writing a Notion is great and Notion is very collaboration focused. So while some people might not find Notion to be the ideal personal note-taking tool, there are things like Obsidian out there for that. Uh, for team note-taking, I really haven't found anything that is better because it's so easy to get your team on a single Notion page. You can share the link in Slack. Um, you can make sure that it's easily accessible in the sidebar here. And then you could just create something like a notes database, just like this. You could add your attendees here, uh, and then everyone can be on this page taking notes. Uh, and I've gone a little bit further than some teams would because I've also added AI generated summaries. And in the bottom, I've added a little tasks view where we can actually add tasks to our task and project management system directly from a note, which is super useful because a lot of times the team is just very busy taking notes. They're in a meeting. And if a task comes up, having this little tasks toggle is super useful to just add that task to your actual tasks database. And then I guess that will bring us to level four because I've kind of already showed you the company wiki in its advanced form, uh, task and project management. So again, not every team should be doing task and project management in Notion, but I do think it works surprisingly well for a lot of teams. For example, um, at Nebula, which is my uh, talent agency and streaming service and whatever the heck else Nebula is, I guess a creator development company, um, we have a whole creator liaison team who works with both of our creators and our, both, both of our creators, both our creators and our sponsors to make sure that sponsorships are running smoothly, make sure that onboarding is going well. Um, that team is, I believe, three people and I built them a, a custom uh, a custom task and projects area inside of Notion. It actually looks quite similar to the one I'm gonna show you today. And they've been using that for probably almost a year at this point. Um, and it works really, really well for them. So again, the management of 180 creators, um, probably 100 plus sponsors, all working through this team, that all happens in Notion and it works really, really well. Really, really well. <laughs> really, really well. Okay, so back to making sure I'm sharing my screen here. Uh, tasks and projects for team it, for teams is really, really simple. And this actually is an instance where I wanna highlight that first rule that I talked about at the beginning of the stream. Um, you wanna keep things simple and you wanna start small. So if you are somebody who has my ultimate brain template, or if you have Creators Companion, which is my content creation template, you might notice that the task management features there are very comprehensive. And we have a lot of advanced things you can do. I built like a whole getting things done workflow into ultimate brain. 
But again, for teams, what you really want is to start small, take baby steps and get buy-in. Because if you just dump a ridiculously complex system on your team all at once, they're not going to understand it the way you do because you've you know spent hours and hours setting it up and getting familiar with it. They're gonna get overwhelmed. And again, it's gonna go back to, okay, well, I'll just do my task management in Slack for now until I get time to understand this. So you wanna make it as easy to understand as possible. And that is what I've tried to do here with this little tasks and projects board. So we have a project board. We can see our tasks in pro or our projects in progress, not started and done. Uh, we can actually go into this project, which I'll show you in a second. And then we have a very simple uh, Kanban style task board. So we have all of our tasks here uh, based on their statuses. So not started in progress, done. I'm showing their assignees, I'm showing their due dates, and I'm showing the projects that they are assigned to. Uh, we also have a by project area. So this is very similar to our normal board view, except we also get some subgrouping by project. So if I want to close that, I could just see this project, which is no project, or I can see my sample project just like that. I have a this week uh, table view here. And this will basically show any tasks that are due within the current week. And then I also added an, un an unassigned area. So if there's like a task manager, like somebody in your company who is literally the manager of tasks, then uh, they'll be able to come in here and see, are there tasks that haven't been assigned to a certain person yet? If, if so, cool, I'll go ahead and assign that to somebody. So this kind of uh, comprises, and I don't think I used that word correctly, composes, maybe, we'll see. There's a whole Wikipedia article on uh, people misusing comprises. Um, this sort of makes up a, a dashboard for a manager in a company, somebody who is like kind of overseeing all task management. And then on an individual level, what I've created is an assigned to me page. Um, this is also in the Nebula task manager setup that I've created and they say it's incredibly useful for them. So basically this is very similar to the dashboard, but it's only going to show tasks that are assigned to you. Uh, and actually I can show you really quickly. There is a really handy filter inside a notion called me. And me doesn't refer to me, Thomas Frank. Me refers to the person looking at this page right now. So if Marissa was looking at this page right now, then she would be seeing all the tasks assigned to her. Same for Alex, same for Ben. Uh, so I have the ex same exact thing, all my tasks. I can split them up by project. I can look at tasks that are due this week. So I could basically use this view right here if I'm on a team to plan out all my work-related tasks for the week works perfectly well. And then we also added a project lead property to our projects. So if I'm the project lead, I also see any of the projects I lead right here. I can open them up and I can see all the, all the uh, tasks associated with that project as well. Uh, going back here, I did tell you I would show you what's inside of a project. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I'll open up the sample project right here, open that as its own main page. I just realized I don't have my cool little mouse circle on. so. That'll improve things. Uh, and in here, I did kind of the same thing. So we have a view of all the tasks in a project, uh, basically split out by their to-do and in progress and complete stages. We have a board view, Kanban view, a lot of people like that. And then again, to make things incredibly clear for each individual person, we have a My Tasks tab. So you can switch over there and you're gonna see only the tasks that are assigned to you personally. Uh, and that's kind of it. We want to keep things again, deliberately simple. So we're not working with a ton of different properties here. We're not doing priorities or GTD lists or anything like that. Instead, we have the name of a task. We have its status. We have a assignee. We have when it's due and then what project is associated with. And uh, I think the only little bit of uh, icing that I put on the cake here is I also added a property to, ass uh, to basically associate tasks with notes again, so you could add tasks in a meeting note and not uh, have to see every task inside that meeting note. But we'll talk about that a little bit later because that is a bit more of an advanced thing. So uh, that's kind of the overview. I'm gonna take a quick break here and answer a few questions. And then we're gonna go on to our little whimsical section where we're gonna actually start mapping out the structure of uh, kind of how our remote company works and how if you're working with a team, whether it be remote or in person, you can start building out a structure of tools to help with your team's organization and communication, uh, sort of with Notion at the center, but we're gonna talk about a few other apps as well. Let me switch over really quickly to my main camera view and I'm gonna look at the questions. Marissa has uh, sort of collected a few for me. So thank you, Marissa. Uh, one question here, how to address the security and privacy issues from Notion to big companies. This is since they do not have end-to-end -end encryption. So uh, Ben Borowski at Notion Mastery wrote an incredible article all about this, going super in detail about it. So if Marissa can pull that and put it in the chat, um, we can share that if you want all the details, but basically I can actually pull this up for you. Uh, Notion has pretty much 
enterprise enterprise grade grade SaaS security. So let's do Notion security. Let's see if we can find the page here. Here it is. So they have an SOC type two um, certificate. They have all this information here. Um, they have they have HIPAA compliance, all this kind of stuff. So when people ask about end to end encryption, it generally means that they don't quite understand how cloud based collaboration apps work because you're not going to get end to end encryption on really any of these sort of collaboration focused apps. You're not going to see it in Slack. You're not going to see it in Google. You're not going to see it in uh, anything else. Like I looked into this when people started complaining about the end to end encryption issue. Um, and it really is just a design pattern that doesn't work for real-time collaboration cloud-based apps because the data has to be unencrypted while you're working with it. Um, so when they say data is encrypted in transit and at rest, that's about the best we can get. And I think that that is reasonable security to expect when it comes to the kind of data you would work with inside of Notion. Now, what that means is you probably shouldn't be storing your passwords inside of Notion. We use Dashlane for password management. There's also Bitwarden and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, use a password manager for password management. Don't be putting passwords inside of Notion or any cloud-based app that isn't a password manager. Uh, and again, even, even if you're using an app where there is end-to-end -end encryption, you have the question of, well, who controls the keys, right? So a good example is Obsidian Sync. Uh, and I love Obsidian. I think Obsidian rocks. They have a, pro a product called Sync, which will basically sync notes across your vaults without you having to worry about using Google Drive for it or whatever. They have two different options there. At least last I checked. There was one where they manage the keys, like almost every other tech company does. And there's one where you manage the keys. If you choose, I manage the keys, you, uh, you personally, that means if you lose the key, you're completely locked out of your vault forever, but they do not have the key. They could not decrypt it. That is like the ultimate in cloud-based security right there. If they manage the keys, well, there might be end-to-end -end encryption, but there's still somebody who isn't you who manages that encryption key. And so what I call it is security through policy, not through math. So there's this whole gradient of security we could talk about in probably a future stream at some point or course content. Um, but the bottom line is I believe that Notion is as secure as any of the other work-based collaboration apps that I use like Slack or Zoom or whatever it is. Uh, and it, it's adequate for my needs. Okay, uh, let's see here. One person said, I might have missed this part, but if, is Team Spaces option only available for businesses? I was wondering if there would be an option to adapt that for communities or members of a group that you're coaching. That uh, is the thing we can probably check out on their page here. So let me just go to Google <laughs> Notion Team Spaces. I am not sure what plan you need on Team Spaces. Uh, maybe with something in pricing that we could look at, actually. Maybe it's on pricing. Yeah, I'm not I'm not entirely sure if Team Spaces is something that is reserved only for business plan. It looks like right here it says private Team Spaces is reserved for business. Um, and I believe that is a Team Space that people who are not in the Team Space can't even see. Um, but beyond that, I, I do know it's available on Plus and it might even be available on free, but then you're gonna be on that uh, block trial. So you're, I think it's, if you're on the free plan and you bring other people in as team members, you have that 1000 block trial. Um, but I do believe you can still create team spaces. That's something I actually haven't tried. So I know we have some other Notion experts in the chat. Maybe they can check that out and uh, answer it for me. Uh, okay, so can you, can you please talk about partial database sharing? How can I hide or share one part of my database or do I need to have five task databases if I have five people that shouldn't see the other tasks? Yes, um, I wanna cover this. This is actually something I plan to cover in the stream, but I'll cover it now because it is a huge question. So basically what this person asking is, is asking is, hey, can I create say a tasks database? And then can I share only a slice of that database with somebody and make sure they can't see the rest of it? So for example, if I had a tasks database and I only wanted to share the tasks assigned to Marissa, could I do that? Could I set up a thing where she couldn't see the rest of the database and she could only see the tasks assigned to her? The answer is no. I want to state that unequivocally because a lot of people think that they come up with these clever workarounds to make it work. The answer is actually no. The only way you can get around this is if you use the API to on a schedule, literally duplicate a slice of a database and copy it to another database. And you give that person permission to see that. I've actually done that before at Nebula. We have like an internal upcoming productions database and I have a script that will basically copy the upcoming uh, productions for the next three months, create another database out of that and leave out some sort of internal information. That is the only way you can do it. 
until Notion eventually gives us um, like filter based permissions or role level policies or things like that. Like we don't have that yet. So even if you think you've come up with a clever workaround, I kind of want to show you how it's defeated here. So yeah, I, I, I want to actually demonstrate this. So we're going to do it really quickly here. So if I just add a new page in my demo here, I'm going to add a blank page. Let's just call it tasks two. I'm going to make a database called inline tasks two, and we will add a property called person. And um, I'll just assign a couple of tasks to Alex. So me being clever, I'm going to add a filter here and I'm going to say person is Alex. And then maybe I even go into the database itself and I set the permissions of the database so that only I have full access. Everyone else only has say can edit content, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. So I've set this to can edit content. Awesome. That would mean that Alex can't mess with the structure of this database. I could even go to the view of the database here and I could lock it just like that. He shouldn't be able to mess with the filters. Okay, I think I've actually created a, a slice of a database that only he can see and he can't see the rest. Here's a problem. If I'm Alex, I can just do slash table, table view, tasks two, and I'm gonna do empty view. And look at that. There is the row that is not assigned to Alex, he can see it. So. Even if you filter the original database, even if you lock it down as much as possible, they can just create a new view of the database that has no filter, no filters whatsoever. And then they see everything. So basically again, until Notion gives us proper row level policy editing or view based permissions and filter based permissions, which we do not have, this can be done. And the only way to get around it is to use the API to literally duplicate a slice of a database and reconstruct it so that you have a new database that doesn't contain the information that that intended viewer should not see. That's it. Okay. Uh, are there any other important questions before we move on? Um, is working with, let's see here, it's working with team free versions. I'm not sure tutorial mentor what that question means there. It's kind of weirdly worded. Um, Purple Sky says the assigned to me page looks great, but will it work if two people click into it at the same time? Yeah, so the assigned to me page, and I'll show it one more time. Uh, it's got a filter that's just called, uh, it's just called me. So if I go here, filter, one rule assigning contains me, whoever's looking at the page is going to see all the tasks that are assigned to them. So even if two people are looking at the page at the same time, they're kind of gonna see a different version of the page because the filters are targeting their user account. So don't even think of it as like a static page. Thinking of it, think of it as a destination full of essentially database queries. And one of those database queries is, okay, who's logged in right now? Let's show them the content that is relevant to them because of this filter. So yeah, if somebody, if two people are looking at it at the same time, if a hundred people are looking at the same time, they're gonna see a different version of it. Uh, okay, more time, Dimitri, or more question. Dimitri says, is there any point in making backups and what does it mean to make a backup of the workspace in PDF? Um, honestly, this is something that I don't do. Uh, you know, maybe I should, it would maybe be smart, but uh, it's something where I know like Notion has their own very robust backup procedures. They have like sharding across many databases, all kinds of stuff like that. So what you can do, and um, there's documentation online for this, so I won't demonstrate it, but what you can do is export the page content of one page as PDF, or you can use the workspace export option, which will export everything. Uh, do keep in mind though, that what Notion gives us is sort of a set of blocks and tools that are unlike anything else out there. It's not like Obsidian where we're literally just building on top of Markdown files. It's its own data format. And that brings a lot of um, benefits. It brings a lot of really cool stuff you can do, but we can't really expect that we can export that data and perfectly represent it in some other app because it is its own thing. It's not like um, you know a Markdown editor like Byword or something like that. And even with Obsidian, uh, they are working on top of files, which I think is a really cool concept, but they're building a whole lot of extra stuff that would not really transfer over to other apps that don't know how to represent that, such as the graph views or the databases uh, or the properties they're adding in. That stuff is Obsidian specific. So you might be able to uh, kind of like export some data that would be able to represent that way in a different app if it was coded the same way. But as far as I know, we don't have like an Obsidian alternative that has all those same features. Uh, okay, one more question, and we're going to go into our next section. Uh, Chris says, if you have a task database and an employee database and you relate them, the employee can only see the tasks that you relate to them, right? Uh, that is incorrect, Chris. So like I just said, uh, and like I demonstrated, um, 
if the employee just creates their own linked view of that tasks database with no filters, they'll see everything. So again, the relation and the filtering there does not actually constitute a change in permissions. It's just a change in what they're seeing in that individual view. So again, there's no way to create a true lockdown slice of a database that uh, the employee can see or that a client can see without them being able to see the rest. There's only one exception that I didn't cover. Um, <clears throat> and that comes down to if you're making a database totally public to people who are not logged into your Notion workspace, you can put filters on the database itself. And because people are from the public, they're not logged in, they couldn't make another view of that database. So that's worth noting. However, even that, I don't know if there's a way around it. I just, I wouldn't, I would not rely on, uh, on filters to create true like permissioning. That's just not a thing. Uh, and one more thing, uh, if it comes to security, what about Matthias Frank's notion guarding? I have never heard of that. So unfortunately can't talk about it here. If there's somebody in the chat that knows about it, let me know, but I have never heard about that before. He does have my last name though, which is pretty cool. Okay. We're going to move on. If I can get my stream back to, yes, it is. Uh, we're gonna move on to our next part of the stream. So I want to start mapping out in a tool called whimsical, which I love and use all the time, uh, a sort of organization for building out your company's communication structures, organization structures, all that kind of stuff. So we're gonna build this on the fly and I don't know how well planned out this section of the stream is. So if there's questions that can help build this out a little bit better, um, feel free to put them in the chat, but I kinda of wanna just like start mapping out how our company works and this will hopefully inspire you to make some of these changes or take inspiration from them at least for your own company. So I'm gonna make a little shape here and I'm just gonna call this Thomas Frank company, because we don't have, actually, let's call it the real name of the LLC, business things and whatnot. That is literally the name <laughs> of my company. I think it was like 10 years ago or something like that. My friend, Steve Cam from Nerd Fitness gave me the advice to uh, name my LLC something generic. So if I ever wanted to have a different blog, it would fit the LLC. And I was like, let me take that advice to the ultimate extreme. And I'm just going to call my company business things and whatnot. <laughs> okay. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to like start mapping out the apps that we're using here. And then we're going to kind of build little views or specific use cases for these apps and sort of talk about how they work. So we have notion here. Um, the other one that we use, most often is Slack, and that's where we do all our team communication. And then I'm gonna make one more called Helper Apps, I think. So this will start to help you sort of model out a structure of tools and communication strategies for uh, keeping everyone in your company on the same page. So within Notion, we have all the things we've already talked about. We have our uh, company wiki. And that's where we're going to have process documents, reference documents, and uh, I'll call them collections. So collections of gear in your company or um, those software licenses or stuff like that. In Slack, we kind of have a strategy where we have specific channels for projects and then we have a few main channels here. So I'm going to make one for main channels. Uh, and the most important one, this this was brought into my company by Marissa, who's in the chat, uh, is a channel called My Week. So the My Week channel is basically a channel where every single week, every person in the company is supposed to come in on Monday. They write out what they got done, what they didn't get done from the previous week, and then they write what they're going to do for the upcoming week. And this combos really well with a task and projects management dashboard where you can kind of see at a glance and sort of at a project level, what everyone's working on, but it's all, it's nice to have an actual channel where everyone's checking in saying, here's what happened. If I didn't get something done, is there a reason why was I blocked for some reason? Uh, and basically every Monday we just have a little period of time, uh, async, but we have a period of time where we're going through and just checking on what people got done. Uh, if they need any help, if they're unblocked, stuff like that. So yeah. And Marissa saying in the chat, it's, uh, it's a way to help us have less meetings or fewer meetings, I guess. So we, I don't think ever have regular meetings actually at our company. Um, I think we might've had like one or two for our team retreat and like one kickoff meeting one time. But other than that, we have a completely asynchronous structure for working. Um, 
I'll switch over to main camera while I explain this. So my company is entirely async first, which means that we communicate asynchronously through Slack and we have an actual policy for responsiveness in Slack. That policy is not like you must respond in 30 minutes or anything like that. Uh, it's a bit more loose and a bit more holistic. What it boils down to is we communicate primarily in Slack and the company's key value is deep work. So everyone in the company should be able to have the ability to sit down and focus on a task for a long period of time without feeling obligated to constantly check Slack or have notifications enabled on their phone. Then they can, they can check in at a regular basis and make sure that there's, they're keeping up with the messages. And crucially, if there is actually something urgent, that's the time when we can actually pick up the phone. So I know this is uh, probably something that makes me a little bit old school, but if I need somebody's attention right away, I'm just gonna pick up my phone, I'm gonna call them and I'm gonna get them on the phone and have a conversation with them. Otherwise, if I need something, I will just put it in Slack and I will wait for them to get back to me. That's it. Um, another thing that Marissa had to teach me is in Slack, there's this little ability to schedule a message. So my team is fully distributed. We've got a guy in Poland. We have a guy in London. We have two people in the Philippines. Uh, we have people covering almost every US time zone at this point. So sometimes my brain will fast forward and I'll go, well, Alex is in Poland. It's like 3 a.m. for him right now. Let me schedule this message for 9 a.m. his time. And Marissa had to tell me like, don't do that because you need to trust everyone on the team to have their own policy set up for device notifications, do not disturb when they're gonna check things. And if they have those things set up and you should be trusting them to do it because that's our policy, then you shouldn't have to be worrying about uh, trying to predict when the best time to send them a message is. Just go ahead and send it. And again, if it's not urgent, you're not calling them, they're gonna get to it on their own time. So that's been really, really helpful for me because uh, I often would beat myself up about scheduling messages at the wrong time, or I'd literally wait and try to remind myself to, to message people. Now I just do it and I trust they're gonna have their settings all set up. Okay, so we have my week channel. We have our general, random, all kinds of stuff like that. And then we also have project channels. So the way we call a project is like P, dash. And uh, what we're working on right now is UB upgrade. So we're doing a uh, full upgrade for ultimate brain, ultimate brain 2.0, creators companion 2.0. So we have a, we have a channel for that. And that gives us the place to have an actual conversation um, about things that are going on. So a lot of people often ask me like, is notion a great app for having conversations on stuff? Right. And it's, it's, it's good enough for it, but I wouldn't call it great. So within Notion, we have a comment area at the top of each page right here. We can have a discussion there. It does kind of work. We also have the ability to put comments on any block or even a selection of text. So I could go in here, I could add a comment just like that. Uh, I could also do it on a specific selection of text. I think it's Command Shift M, yes it is. So you could do that there. And we often do that for say video scripts or video outlines, or if we're outlining um, a new product launch or something like that, we are going to have comments in the Notion space. However, maybe this is just me. I get the feeling it's not just me. I don't think that Notion is the place to have an actual conversation about something. I think Slack or uh, maybe Twist, if you're a Doist fan or Discord, maybe not Discord, their privacy is not the best for business stuff, but uh, Microsoft Teams, whatever it is, use that as a place to have discussions. So at least for us, it's like the, uh, is, is, there a, is, there a, is there a two item word for trifecta? Is there a duofecta? <laughs> it's the, uh, the pair the ultimate pair of Notion and Slack, that's what sort of, yeah, perfect couple, there we go. That's what sort of constitutes the majority of our task and project and communication and process management, all that kind of stuff. Uh, okay, so going back to our um, little diagram here, we also have some helper apps. And if people have questions about Notion or Slack, feel free to put them in the chat and Marissa can grab them for me. Um, we're gonna talk about the helper apps as well. This is pretty simple. We have a few that we find really, really useful. Loom is the main one. And Loom, again, lets me just really quickly make a screen recording to either go over a problem that we're having or to make a piece of documentation. So that is something that we pay for as a team. We find it incredibly useful. Um, another one, I would say this is less for team comms, but sometimes it does come in handy is a text expander. So I think text expander is more useful for customer service since we have um, people who ask a lot of the same questions. So what we do is we have a database of sort of text snippets that quickly answer these questions. And how this comes into team communication is there is a team plan. 
So we have a text expander account. I think we have four people on it, our whole support staff. And what that allows us to do is if somebody writes up a text snippet to quickly answer a repeat question, now everyone else in the team has access to that snippet and they can use it as well. So if Alex and Ben are going into our circle support space to answer technical questions, if Alex writes up a snippet, Ben can then use it. Same thing for uh, Cass and Christine. If they're going through email support and they're processing refunds or they're doing um, they're doing like pre-sales uh, questions, things like that, they're going to have access to the snippets that they've created for themselves. Uh, another tool you can use if everyone on your team is on Mac is Raycast. I freaking love Raycast. In fact, I personally pay for Raycast, even though the team is on Text Expander instead, but they also have a really good snippet tool where you can create text snippets and you can share them across your team. I think that is Raycast Pro you use and it'll even like sync across your devices. The only problem with Raycast is it's only on Mac. So if you're not a completely Mac only shop, then uh, Raycast is not really going to work for your entire team, though I personally love the heck out of it. Um, another one that I didn't think of when I was prepping this stream is Front. So Front is not that you don't have to use Front, but uh, we do basically recommend having a sort of centralized email inbox or customer service inbox. We use Front for that. So the reason we like Front is it basically lets us bring in all of our email addresses and then it creates like this unified box where you can set permissions for each inbox. And most importantly, you can assign conversations to specific people and you can have a threaded comment conversation within an email conversation. So a really common thing that happens with us is we'll have somebody who's like, hey, I bought the template, but I didn't get it yet. And um, we'll reach out to our payment processor and they're like, well, hey, the payment didn't go through. Maybe it got stuck on Stripe's end or stuck on PayPal's end or whatever. So it often requires us to have communication between the person who's handling the customer service, maybe me or Marissa, and we can have those threaded discussions directly in front in the context of the email thread, which is super duper helpful. Uh, and that is why we pay a stupid amount per month for front. There's another one I haven't tried. I'm not gonna force my uh, my team to <laughs> switch off of front because it's fine, but um, Groove seems like a decent alternative that actually costs a lot less and does a lot of the same stuff. So that might be worth checking into. It kind of frustrates me how much I pay for front, but again, we're kind of locked in at this point. So take that as a, uh, we use this the tool, not maybe a glowing recommendation of the tool because it is quite expensive. Uh, and I think that might do it for the helper apps there. So I'm going to take a quick look at the questions we have collected really quickly. And then we're going to go into the next section of the tutorial, which I believe is permissions. Fun, fun, fun stuff. Okay. So looking at the questions here, tutorial mentor says, uh, having two different team spaces and you want Kanban from team space one to be shown in team space two and team space two can make changes, which will also happen at team space one. Uh, okay. So I think the question here is, um, can I have two different team spaces? Let me show this actually. Can I have two different team spaces in a workspace? So say I have general here and demo here. Could I have a database in demo that people in the general team space can see? Uh, and as far as I know, yes. And I'm saying as far as we know, because my team actually has not adopted multiple team spaces yet in our main workspace, which I do not show on stream. Uh, we have just one team space called general and everything works in there. So really we're going to get the, we're going to get into this more in the, in the permission section. Team spaces is just another layer of permissions that help you sort of segment your workspace up a little bit better. Um, and it also kind of helps you to make the sidebar a bit cleaner, but that's kind of it. And if you have a database in one, but somebody has access to it, you could, I think you could make a uh, linked view in another team space. In fact, we can literally try that right now. So let's make a blank page really quickly. And we'll just say a uh, task test right there. And let's do slash uh, table view tasks three. And there it is. Yep. So I'm in these two team spaces. This tasks three database exists in the demo team space. I can verify that by viewing the database and checking the breadcrumbs right there. I can see it's in demo and yet I can still see it inside of the general team space. So really it comes down to the permissions model on a person to person basis and team spaces just gives you extra, extra capabilities of managing that person to page permission relationship. So I'm going to delete that because it's going to make my workspace all messy. Don't want that. And I'm going to check the questions one more time here. Uh, Mark says, what about turning one of the databases into a group chat? What's the point to ever even leave notion? Yeah, you could do that. Um, 
I think that's an example of like trying to mold a tool into something that it's not really good at doing. You definitely could do it. But again, I think about like, what, what are the tools that are going to keep people coming back? Right? So, uh, I think about this a lot actually with building Flylighter. like how do we make the tool so joyous to use that people have no resistance to using it whatsoever. And I think for writing, uh, especially and for building like company wikis and stuff, notion does really, really well in that area. Um, in my opinion, writing in notion is a joy, which is why every single time I try to test out a new note taking app, I'm just like, I wish I was writing a notion right now. It's so much more fun to write a notion, especially when it comes to like embedding screenshots and stuff like that. It's just so seamless. So think about that, uh, on your own part, but more importantly, for the sake of your teammates. Again, it's about all being on the same page and building a system that encourages people to use the system and not go, ah, I can't be bothered. I can't be arsed. I'm going to go just like put my tasks on a sticky note right now. That is what you want to avoid. So if you're trying to like, you know, shove group chat into a weird notion database because you think it's cool to have everything in notion, um, you're probably not going to get that buy-in from your team and that's going to cause communication breakdowns. And I actually have a good example of that. Uh, when, when our CEO at Nebula, Dave, finally got into Notion, because I was telling him about it for, for years and he kept making fun of me like, oh, Tom's the Notion guy, it's stupid. And he finally got into it. There was like a week or two where he got into it to the point where he almost was trying to get people on the team to stop using Excel for certain things. Uh, and we eventually realized like, you can't do that. Like we can't do our financial modeling inside of Notion because yeah, you can kind of sort of make it work, but kind of sort of make it work is not good enough for team use. You have to use a tool that feels good to use. And ideally you're creating a suite of those tools that talk to each other and that form this great foundation for your team to actually do their work. So financial modeling should be done in, uh, what's what's the Mac equivalent to Excel? It's not pages, it's, it's uh, whatever it is, <laughs> whatever that one is, or Excel or Google Sheets, because a spreadsheet application is what should be used for financial modeling. It's what's gonna feel good. Um, documentation process, uh, project management, I think can be done in notion in a way that feels seamless, feels really good to use communication should probably be done in a communication centric app with a bit of crossover when it comes to commenting on specific things in notion. That is just my opinion. Okay. Uh, Noah says, is, is there a text expander app for Slack for those of us who use Slack for external something with clients, external CS, I don't know what CS means. <laughs> um, I think text expander just works in Slack. So, uh, if you want to, if you want to clarify that question in the chat, uh, Noah, you can, but, uh, the thing that is kind of coming to mind for me right now is text expander or text snippets and Raycast. Those are sort of app agnostic. So you don't really need to have text snippets in Slack because you can just do it in text expander. Um, I will say front actually does have its own sort of text snippet or canned responses feature. I think even Gmail has that as well. So if you're looking for something that is like directly in an app, I know front has that. Maybe there are Slack bots or Slack apps that integrate with Slack that actually kind of add that to a slash command or something. Um, I can sort of architect in my head how you'd build that already. So it probably exists, but again, Text expander is just a keyboard shortcut away. You can paste it right into the Slack uh, bar when you're in Slack. I don't see a reason not to use it. Okay. Uh, Mark says, if it comes to helping apps, let's not forget about Flylighter. Thank you for helping me to promote my own app, uh, Mark. So yeah, if anyone hasn't heard about it, we are building our own app called Flylighter, which is all about instant knowledge capture. So it's going to be the best Notion web clipper you've ever seen, along with a mobile app for uh, capturing web content, for capturing ideas. We're going to have a whole like voice notes to text function in there. So if you do want to get on our waitlist, flylighter.com is uh, what you can do for that. And then one more question from Dimitri before I go into our next section. Uh, lately, sometimes default database templates take a very long time to load in a new page for that database. Yeah, I encountered that yesterday. Um, and that did get reported in the notion ambassador Slack. So I know that they are aware of the issue beyond that. I don't have any other information. Okay. So we're going to go to our next portion of this little stream. And I keep going away from my stream planning in this tab. I want to go back over to this tab, try to remember it, Tom. Okay. So the next thing I want to go over and we're going to try to make this brief. This needs to be a video on my channel. At some point, we're going to talk about permissions and team spaces. So. The way that permissions in Notion work, uh, number one is we have different levels, right? So we have workspace, 
we have groups, we have team spaces, we have page level permissions, and then we have what's called the permissions cascade, which I will talk about in a second, just a concept. So basically everything we're seeing here on the screen is the Notion workspace. And that includes all of our team spaces. I have my private areas here, I've got my shared pages. So if I go to my settings and members, and I go to uh, right here, I think we've got members, we can see there are actual access levels. Everyone here is a workspace owner right now. So Alex, Ben, and myself are in this template demos workspace. Um, I didn't wanna put the rest of the team in the workspace because this is a demo workspace I use just for streaming and I'm paying uh, $8 times three people just for this demo workspace. So my whole team's not in here, but uh, you can see they're all workspace owner. So they, can change the workspace settings and as owners they're going to have access they're going to have the ability to access any team space even if i don't put myself in a specific team space i could add myself later because i'm an owner of the workspace now i could set alex to member and that would basically make him not an admin so if i did that then i would have better and more granular management over his permission to say specific team spaces and he wouldn't be able to add himself so if you are the administrator of your Notion workspace, what I would recommend is set yourself as workspace owner and everyone else as member. That's like the foundation here. Um, you can also, I think, have an invite link. And I think you can also set this link to be domain specific if you're on the enterprise plan, maybe business plan, I'm not sure. Um, so you can let people actually join and then they would join as members. They won't join as workspace owners. I just set these two guys as workspace owners because um, they do a lot of Notion template help with me. So they deserve to have full access to this workspace. We can also add guests to our workspace. These people do not count towards our, our billing here, uh, but you have to give them specific access to pages. You can't say add a guest to an entire team space and you can't add a guest to an entire workspace. You have to just give them permissions to access a specific page. Um, now, the way you start architecting your space can give a guest a lot of access, but you do have to keep in mind that in terms of top level pages right here, that is what guests get access to. And you would have to manually add them to new pages if you wanted them to have access to new pages. So uh, let's talk about team spaces really quickly. You can see here, we have a couple of team spaces, demo, general, sales. And for each of these, I can go into the team space settings. And this is how I can start to sort of segment access to a Notion workspace that is meant for a bigger team, right? So here we have, uh, first and foremost, the open permission. If I open this up here, I can see I have a few different choices. The default one means everyone in this workspace must be a member. So default would be great for a team space like general. If you had like a wiki with, um, you know, uh, time off policies and company mission statements and whatever else you want to have for literally everyone in the company to see, you would set that team space as default. And uh, then anybody who comes into your team uh, gets added to the Notion workspace, they're going to be instantly there. Open means anyone can see it and they can join it, but they will not join it by default. So maybe you have um, a team space for, I don't know, company events or something like that. And you don't want to force people into it. You could set that to open. Closed would be anyone can see this, but they will not be able to join on their own. They have to be added by the person who is managing the team space. So say you have an engineering team and you don't want the intern from marketing to have access to the engineering team space, you would set that team space as closed. They would be able to see it, but they wouldn't be able to join it. And then if you upgrade to the business plan, there is one called private where only members can even see that it exists. So if you wanna have a team space called Secret Cabal, where we wear robes and chant, you would probably wanna to upgrade to the business plan, maybe even using my affiliate link for Notion, uh, and you would wanna set that as a private team space. So, you know, for, for the five people out there who want to start a cult in Notion. <laughs> uh, and then we have actual um, permissions here. So team space members can have full access or we can set uh, their permissions a little bit differently here. And then everyone else in template demos, again, because I'm open here, I could set these permissions. So if there was somebody who wasn't a member of the team space, I could let them actually view the content in the team space by setting can view like that. They'd be able to come in and view it, but because they're not members of the team space, then they would not be able to actually change it. So yeah, <laughs> someone's saying uh, Notion is already a cult. Eh, it kind of is. I mean, people are pretty, pretty darn into it. And I think, again, that comes down to the fact that it's like easy to use. It makes you want to use it. And then that combines with what's called the Ikea effect, where the act of building something yourself makes you feel more ownership over it. So Notion kind of like nailed that balance. And I think that's why they're so popular, even though there are other tools out there that can do other things. Notion has that popularity, I think because of that combination. So if you're maybe a startup founder like me, 
those are two things I would keep heavily in mind when building your products. Uh, ease of use to the point where it becomes like a joy, almost an addiction to use. And then um, just enough customizability that people get that Ikea effect and they feel ownership over what they've built in the tool. Cool. So I can add members here. Again, if I were to set this to closed, just like that. Now, if somebody comes into my workspace, maybe they join a general team space, but I don't want them to be able to join this demo workspace. Now that it's closed, they can see it. You can see that everyone else in template demos has no access. I could set this to can view. They could come in and view stuff, but I would have to, as the team space owner, come in and add them manually if they were going to get ask, uh, access here. Okay. So we talked about team spaces. Uh, there's also a groups. And let me see if I can do that here. So if I go to my members here, I can create groups and this is useful for basically like creating teams. So maybe I have like a, um, admin team or management team, or I have an engineering team. I can create a group. Let me just create one. I'll call it engineering like that. Actually, let's call it imaginary. And inside of imaginary, we'll put, uh, well, Walt Disney's not in this place. So I'm gonna put myself, I'll put Alex. Sorry, Ben doesn't get to be an imaginary for now. So now I have a group and what I can do now that I have a group is I can set permissions based on the group, which makes it way less tedious because I don't have to do it for specific people. So if I come into say this notion for team stream document that I'm on right now, I can click share. Now everyone at demo currently has full access. Let's change that. Let's say everyone at demo has no access. Nobody gets access except for team space owners. So right now it's actually me, everyone at template demos can view. Let's set that to no access. Now I'm the only person who can see this page, but I could add a group. So you can see here, I have my actual people here. Some of them are guests, some of them are full members, but I also now have this imaginary group. If I add this, I can set full access. I can set edit, comment, view. Let's do edit, invite, cool. So now I have access to this page fully. And then the imaginary group, which is you can see me and Alex uh, has edit, in, edit access. And I have full access. I think I might've actually gotten rid of my full access. I'm not sure here, it doesn't say it uh, via demo. There it is, okay. Uh, but yeah, so now everyone at demo, it's me, full access, everyone else, no one else. But now the imaginary group has edit access. So that is a way you can start to cut down on the work involved in setting permissions specifically on pages uh, because you can do a group instead of actually like picking every single person and inviting them individually. Okay, so. I now want to talk about, let me see if I got to it yet, uh, page permissions and the permissions cascade. I love the term cascade because I play a lot of Magic the Gathering and cascade is one of my favorite effects they ever brought into the game. Um, but the permissions cascade in Notion is a little bit different. So I think the best way to illustrate this is to show and point out the breadcrumbs at the top of the page here. So the permissions cascade basically means the permissions for a page are either something you set manually or if not, they will inherit the manually set permissions of the nearest parent page. So what I mean by that is, uh, let's see if I go to meeting notes. I have a page called meeting notes. Inside that page, I have a database also called meeting notes. And then I have specific pages in here. And I think I actually want to um, demonstrate this a little better. So let me create like a cascade of pages here. So we're gonna call this page one. And then in here, I'm gonna do slash page. I'm gonna call this page two, page three inside of page two, and finally page four inside of page three. So now you can see we've kind of created like this full cascade, page one, page two, page three, page four. I go into share. I have full access to this page via demo. So that is what I meant. We traverse up the tree to the nearest parent page that has specific permissions set. And if none of the pages in the tree all the way up to the top have specific permissions set, then it's going to inherit the permissions of the team space we're in. Um, otherwise, if I had set permissions, it would inherit those. So let's, let's actually demonstrate that. I'm gonna go to page two now, and let's actually set some specific permissions. Let's say team space members can only comment on this. Everyone at template demos can view. Cool. So now if I go to page three, page four, we should see I have full access based on demo, but if somebody else was in this, ah, here he is. This access is based on page two. Changing this asset access will restrict permissions of the page. So you can see my personal access is based on demo because I didn't restrict my own access on page two. 
But here we can see this rule is being set by what I said on page two. So that is the permissions cascade, basically. Uh, and that might be all I had to say on permissions. Again, this is probably something that deserves its own video or stream or article. Um, but I probably want to get questions from people. Uh, so let's also talk about, let's see, we also talked about filter views of database already. Let's talk about database locking database permissions really quickly here, because this is actually quite important for teams. So here I have a meeting notes database and let me actually make sure I'm on it. Yeah, I'm fully on it. Let's see here. Yeah, I am cool. So when you're building databases in Notion, uh, one thing that you might want to make sure to do is to go up into the share menu for a specific database. Um, and let's see here, am I on the database? Cause I should see, yeah, I can. Okay. For a specific database. Uh, and anyone who is not the notion architect in your company, anybody who's not like the admin of the notion space should have, in my opinion, can edit content permission and nothing higher. So let me explain that difference here. If I set everyone at template demos to can edit content, what that means is they can make new pages in this database, just like that. They can edit the values of uh, permissions or of, of properties on a specific row. So I could add a person here as an attendee. Let's add Ben. Cool. I could change the date there, but because let's say I only have can edit permission, I can't delete one of these properties. I can't go into one of these properties and change its settings. Um, if I had a select or a multi-select property, I wouldn't be able to change any of the options there, or add new ones. All I can do is essentially what I would be able to do in a traditional app, like say Todoist or Jira or something like that. I could, um, I could add new rows, I could edit their content, but I can't change the structure of the database. So in my opinion, when you're working with a team, setting everyone except for say you or the admin in your company to can edit content is very useful. The other thing I often recommend doing is just locking databases. So you can go to the three dot menu right up here. You can lock a database and that is going to prevent any changes being made to the property settings. Properties can't be deleted. Again, I can still add new pages. I can set the date. I can add attendees just like that. We're all good to go, but I can't actually change this database until I unlock it like that. That I think is a really good practice to adopt because again, Notion is like digital Legos. And once you have a setup, then you're working with your team, you don't want people messing with the Legos. So this is like gluing the Legos shut, which in the Lego movie is shown to be a very bad thing. And Will Ferrell is kind of a villain for it. But I'm going to say here, justice for Lord Business, justice for Will Ferrell in this context. We want to use the craggle on the Notion Legos once we have the system working, because we don't want people accidentally deleting properties, deleting information, stuff like that. In many cases, you can restore properties. It's not the end of the world if things happen, but some cases that might not be the case. And you just want to make sure you don't have to deal with that headache. So lock your databases um, and you're going to be a lot happier. Okay. Going back to meeting notes. Let's go back to my little stream plan here. Open that up as <laughs> uh, one person saying that lock needs a password feature. Uh, I'm wondering if people who don't have access to the database can unlock it. That's a good question. We should check into that. So we talked about permissions. We talked about locking. We already talked about filtered views of the database. Uh, if you didn't catch that, there'll be a stream archive later on on the live tab of my channel. So check that out. As a recap, again, you cannot make a filtered view of a database where the person only can see that view unless you literally use the API to create like a duplicate database. You just can't do it. So don't think that I can have like a client's database and a tasks database and make sure one client can only see the tasks assigned to them. It doesn't work. They could just make a new view of the tasks database and take all the filters off of it and see everything. Um, eventually we're gonna get, eventually we're gonna get those abilities, but it's not happening yet. I did see the CEO of Notion replied to Ben Borowski on Twitter recently saying they were working on it. But again, I think it's a pretty hard problem. So. Hopefully we get it soon, um, but who knows when we're gonna get. Okay, so we've gone through all the lecture material. Thank you for listening, class. The next part of this stream is gonna be the build with me. So this will take maybe a little bit longer. I guess we've already been going for an hour and 15 minutes. I almost called it. I said the first hour would be lecture material. So my fudge ratio on this should be 25%, right? <laughs> if you were here for the formula stream last week, you would probably know what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna do a quick question and answer break, a quick take a drink and stop talking so much for a full hour break. And then we're going to go into the build with me and I'm going to show you how to actually build all of these cool things that I've demonstrated in the stream. So we're going to build the knowledge base, 
We're gonna build a tasks and projects area and we're gonna build a meeting notes area. And this will be sort of functioning as like uh, an archived, I don't know, lesson on how to literally build this. Uh, and then hopefully this will help us to sort of formulate our notion for teams course that we're gonna be working on, ideally releasing in 2024. Um, I think Alex is working on like an, an interest form for that somewhere. We might have that in the stream. Otherwise, uh, I guess what I will say before I go into the question and answer break is, yeah, we're working on a full course for Notion for Teams. And then in 2024, we're also gonna be ramping up our ability to offer consulting services and coaching services for teams that need it. So uh, I wasn't able to get a actual sign up form for this made before the stream. Prepping all this material took a ton of time. So sorry for that. Uh, but if you are interested in either that course or consulting services in the future, over on thomasjfrank.com, we have Learn Notion. There's a newsletter link right there. That will get you on our Notion Tips newsletter. And then at a point in the future, um, oh, and it looks like we already did it. So <laughs> Marissa uh, is correcting me already. Looks like we already have the finished tally form. I think I just didn't see a little uh, preview box. So never mind. You don't have to sign up for our general newsletter. You can if you want, but it looks like we also have a Notion for Teams sign up link. Here it is, cool. So yeah, we have a, we have a tally.so form in the description. And uh, if you are interested in our course or in consulting services, you can fill this out. Otherwise, again, if you want the easiest possible way to get updated about that in the future, we have the newsletter link there, which I will send to Marissa really quickly in Slack so she can actually see it. And I just realized I can put it in the chat myself. I have my own chat. Check it out. I'm interacting with the chat just like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to go through some questions really quickly here. Let me take a quick little drink. Okay. Um, so one person's asking, would it be possible to adapt the para method to the business level? So I mean, using para tools and procedures to manage a team uh, and share the most common objectives and missions. So yeah, I think that would actually be possible. Um, that is something we're gonna have to think through. So for those who are unfamiliar, PARA stands for Projects, Areas, Resources, and Archives. It is, I think, a primarily personal productivity focused method uh, created by my friend Tiago Forte. It's in his book, Building a Second Brain, along with his course. And uh, if you didn't know Ultimate Brain, my full template for personal productivity is built on top of the PARA method. I would want to actually talk to Tiago about how to adapt that for business. In fact, that gives me an idea for a video that I could do probably on my main channel. How can a team adapt para? So great question. Um, I think we could do it. Don't have a specific implementation yet, but in the future, I think we will. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Uh, Ashley says any info on inability to cascade content only like with pages. Um, I think content only is just a database level permission. So I can edit content. Um, if that's not where you're asking, let me know. But yeah, I think the the can edit content permission is specifically just for um, databases, not for individual pages. Aaron says, when does it make sense to pay for a member instead of having them as a guest? Is there a limit to guest pages or any relevant differences? Uh, you'd be saving a lot of money, right? Yes. So like I said before, we have the page cascade. And if you're thinking through things here um, within knowledge base, I could, I could literally just call this page home. And then I could put everything inside of that page and I could I could set guest access right there. So Notion is actually incredibly generous with what you're able to do with guests. And uh, you could add a lot of guests and you can get a lot done in your company um, just adding guests to specific pages. And I actually make quite a lot of use of that. In the settings and members here, you can see we have three full members and I wanna make sure all those people have full access to the workspace but then there are three guests and these people don't need access to every single page. So I've opted not to pay the eight bucks a month for each of them. That saves me 24 bucks a month because they only need access to these specific pages that they're on. So what it really comes down to when you're adding people as full members is do they need access to an entire team space right there? Do you, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that's like super compelling. I think there is, but I haven't thought about this in a little while. So uh, that again is something that we should probably address in future content. But yeah, uh, what it mainly comes down to is, do you wanna give people access on a full team space level or do you wanna give them access on a page level? Uh, and I think there are some other details that are kind of detailed in Notion's pricing page. And then I think there is actually a guest limit on each workspace. It might be on the pricing page here. Yeah, so free, you can have 10 guests, plus you can have 100 guests, 250 on business. 
And maybe they even have a page on this. Maybe we can look on it. Google uh, Notion guests. So let's see if it even says if there's a difference here. Members, guests, guests versus members. Here it is. Cool. All right. Uh, they can't be given workspace wide access. That's kind of what I already talked about. They have to be invited to individual pages to view them and their sub pages. Let me zoom in a little bit for you. That makes it a little better. Uh, they can't create new pages outside of the ones they have access to. Cool. They can't be added to groups of members. This actually is significant. So again, if you have a larger team and you have a more complex workspace where you're often setting permissions, this can get kind of tedious. If you have tons and tons of, uh, of, of root or of guests, you might want to add some of them as members, put them in a group. That way you can give group access. Uh, personally, I find that worth it. Again, I'm trying to reduce as much friction as possible in my business. So yeah, can't adjust workspace settings or billing information. To me, that's a plus. Can't add new members, can't add new integrations. So I think what it really comes down to is trust and access. Um, and if you're working with a team enough, this is going to become very obvious to you in a way that I don't think gets obvious at a purely theoretical level. Like if you're sitting there as an individual, or maybe you work with a few contractors who have very limited responsibilities right now, you're probably not thinking in terms of, I want to give my team as much access as they need to do things autonomously without my permission needed. But as somebody who runs an 11 person team with many of those people on the team as full-time employees, we've gotten to that point. We've gotten to the point where I realized like, I'm a bottleneck in many situations. And because we're async first, it, it's actually very important for me to not be a bottleneck because I am not expected, like everyone else, I'm not expected to be instantly reactive. I'm spending a lot of my time, again, doing like a three hour stream like this. If there's somebody on Slack trying to get my attention and it's not about the stream, they're gonna have to wait for three hours. So if say Alex does not have access to do a specific thing with our notion, like say uh, add an integration or something like that, he might be blocked for the next three hours or because he's in Poland, he might be blocked for the entire workday, go to bed. I can't get to his request until the end of the stream and he wastes an entire day working on something. So it really comes down to, yeah, trust, access, bottlenecks, that kind of thing. Weigh that against the $8 a month per person and uh, make a decision. Uh, okay, cool. So let's look at any more questions that are on here. I was just answering errands, I think. Surgical says, if I create a client portal, link a database on that page from a different page, let's say a tickets database and give that client guest access, they can't see the linked database. So that would be true, yes. Surgical's asking if I have a page and I link a database on that page that lives somewhere else and they don't have access to that linked database, then in that case, they would not be able to see the entire database. So again, um, permissions in Notion are set at the page level and we can consider a database to be a page. So if I don't give somebody access to a database, and then I link that database, I create a link to view on a page they do have access to, they're just gonna see a blank space, baby. <laughs> uh, YC, why combinators in the chat? Just kidding. Uh, YC says, would you in general recommend using Notion for a team of 50 people with mixed age and mixed digital experience? Yes, so the more people you're working with and the less tech savvy experience you're working with, the more you want to follow rule number one, which I will go back to right here and highlight, Start small and get buy-in. That's really what it's all about. So if you have a 50 person team and a lot of them don't have a whole lot of tech experience, going to a knowledge base page like this requires almost no tech experience whatsoever. Like if I'm working on a team, um, like I'll, I'll use my mom as an example. My mom has learned how to use Excel, has learned how to use Word, but she doesn't have a ton of tech experience. She still calls me quite often for computer help. Um, she works at a fairly mid-sized company at this point, like maybe 30 people or something like that. Um, if she was like told, go to the knowledge base and go to a page like this and look at the process, she could easily handle that. Like she'd have no problem with this whatsoever. If she was told like, hey, we're running a huge uh, getting things done process and we do all of our team communication in this one database page and stuff like that, she would not understand any of it. And she would probably just go back to writing on sticky notes and sticking them to her desk. So again, it's all about, can you start small? Can you get buy-in from everyone on your team? And if you can, use that tool. If you can't, don't use that tool. Uh, and you know, because you're working on a team, it may involve creating some trainings. So I actually made this as an example in the knowledge base right here. Uh, we have a tasks and projects guide. And as prep for this stream, I shot a little three minute overview of how our tasks and projects page work uh, works. And then I used the Loom transcript, pasted it here, and I used Notion AI to create a summary of it just in case that's useful. Uh, 
And so if somebody like my mom was coming into my team and needed to know how to use tasks and projects, boom, there it is. I could easily link it to her in Slack. She'd watch this video and she'd know how to use it. So that is an example of, uh, I wouldn't say like pure onboarding, it's more like reference guide, but as part of an onboarding process, they might have a access to a guide like this. And I think somebody is actually asking about new team onboarding um, in there. I didn't have time to write up like a sample new team member onboarding here, but basically you would wanna create a step-by-step -step article for how to onboard a new team, a team member. So what's that gonna involve? It's gonna involve probably a training session on how to work things, depending on the role that they are uh, bringing in. It's gonna involve uh, adding them to specific tools. So in our specific case, if I'm adding somebody to my company, they need a Google Apps account for our domain. They need a Slack account. They need a Notion account. They need a text expander account, most likely. They need access to our Circle workspace. Um, and they need access to our front account, at least. So those, I think five or six I just mentioned, there would be a section for each of them, literally just showing it. Maybe there would be individual Loom videos for each one of them. And I would create a well-structured onboarding article. And again, it's all about investing a little bit of extra time up front to create something that becomes a resource. So now you are not spending time again and again, uh, answering questions and acting as a bottleneck because you probably have your own work to do beyond onboarding other employees. So keep that in mind. And uh, I keep thinking of Linkin Park lyrics every time I say a word. <laughs> uh, couple more questions here. One person says, hi, Thomas, do you know if Notion AI can use the comments in a page and extract information from those comments, like the name of a person that commented? Um, I'm not 100% sure about this, but I think right now Notion AI cannot get comment uh, content. I think right now it just gets the, the uh, page content specifically. And then I think um, some pieces of Notion AI can reference database property values, but in general, that's been a little bit buggy in my testing. So I would say it's rock solid for page content. Database properties, maybe not so much. Comments, I don't think it can access it all right now. Uh, Dimitri says, how to conduct team onboarding? Oh, that was the question I saw in the chat. So I already kind of covered that. And then uh, Mark says, when is it beneficial to use a team space? And when is it uh, beneficial to just share with somebody as a guest? I think I've already covered that. So again, it's all just about like, does somebody need more access so you're not being a bottleneck? Maybe add them as a member. If they need only a really limited set of access, save yourself some money and set them as a guest. Uh, cool. So let me take a quick drink here. Let's see if there's anything else. And we do have some Lincoln Park lyrics in the chat. So <laughs> that's great to see. Okay. So that is the lecture portion of this stream. We're not going to go into the build with me portion of this stream. We're literally going to build this out. Uh, maybe if I were smart, I would say this as paid course content, but I will probably still have it in our course and sell it. And then you guys are on the stream, you get it for free anyway. So we're going to literally build this out and I'm going to show you exactly how to do it. Uh, we're going to start at level one with our company wiki simple. So this is like the most dead simple way to start using notion with your team. Uh, and this is the most dead simple way to build it. So I think what I'm going to do is actually make a new team space. So you can see me build this literally from scratch. So we'll create one right here, a little plus icon, just like that. Uh, let's just call this a stream demo. And we can even describe it. I'm gonna build stuff like Bob the Builder. Check me out. We can set it to open, we can set it to closed. We already went through those permissions. I'll just keep it open for now, create this team space. And there it is. I can invite people if I want to. Maybe I wanna invite Alex. Maybe I wanna invite, uh, I can even invite well, I think if I, actually, what happens if I, yeah, she's a guest. Martin's a guest too. I think Ben is the only other member here. So there he is. And it's a little bit weird that when I start typing here, this kind of just gets cut off. I wonder if that's because of how zoomed in I am right now. Not sure. But we'll have Ben there. I'll invite them. They could be my team space. So again, team spaces are just a way to segment out a specific workspace. I think they were a response to a lot of teams actually having multiple Notion accounts or not accounts, but multiple Notion workspaces in one account. Um, this just creates faster access and better permissions management versus that old method. So we can also give this an icon. I think I have to go to the team space settings to do that. Yep. So uh, I don't know. Let's give it. Oh, they actually moved icons over here. It used to be in the middle. Let's give it a nice little space invader emoji or icon. And then I'm going to delete this, te this team space home. We don't need it. And I'm going to add our first page. So we're going to call this knowledge base. 
You could also call it company wiki. I think I use the term knowledge base because I had a IT job in college and we called this the knowledge base. Um, and I like to make this a full width page because I like to have a couple of different sections here. So basically thinking about your own company, you'd wanna think about um, the sort of different sections of your company. And one person in the chat is asking, what do you think about the turn into wiki feature versus using a regular database? So if you don't know, there's actually up in the three dot menu here, this wiki right here. I don't really like it personally. <laughs> Uh, I tried out the wiki feature again. I tried my best to, to make it work really well um, as part of stream prep here, but there's a couple of problems with the turn to wiki feature. I can cover those maybe in some future content, but what, what it kind of comes down to is the more advanced version of the knowledge base, and this is literally what we use in our company, uses linked database views underneath these sections. And what that would allow us to do is like sort. So if I open this up, I can make a sort criteria. Let's just do by name and ascending right now to alphabetize it. Now I can literally sort those articles within that specific section. And I think that's pretty useful. I also have this announcement section right here. So this would be like a nice section for uh, if somebody on your team is like writing weekly newsletters for your team, or there's like information about a team retreat, something like that. I would probably want to sort that by the due date or the, uh, the date of the announcement specific to this view. So if I were to create a wiki, which I can literally do just like that, I have to go through this little onboarding before I can even do it it kind of like turns the entire page into a database. And so if I have pages, like I'll just call this page one for now, uh, we do get like an owner verification and tags property by default. And I can switch over to this all pages here. But what I'm not gonna be able to do is create that nice linked database view without also seeing the same pages duplicated beneath it. So you can, you can play with that if you want to. But again, I'm just not the biggest fan of this wiki feature, so we are not gonna use it in this stream. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, undo the wiki and just use a regular empty page. So let me check full width, we're still there, cool, cool. What I'm gonna do is create two columns, so two C, just like that. We're gonna do a slash one and I wanna get actually my other knowledge base up for reference. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put that in a different tab. And let's look through the different sections we're gonna build, business admin, announcements, customer service, technical service, cool. So call that business admin. Call this one announcements slash one. Sometimes I think like it would be fun to do competitive notion. Like how fast could I do stuff here? <laughs> but here, all I'm doing is typing slash two C again, and then slash one to make a heading. That's all I'm doing. So this is literally, I mean, one of the easiest ways to start building up a little company wiki in notion beneath here, you could just start creating pages. So here I might have um, new member onboarding. just like that. And you just create pages just like that. Uh, here's a cool trick you could do if you knew a lot of pages that you needed to create. So for customer service, maybe you had one for processing refunds, another one for um, handling uh, disputes, another one for uh, adding customers manually to Circle, which is our community platform. So you could have a, a bullet list just like that. So say you like, you know what articles you need, make a bullet list. You could highlight them just like this, go to the six dot menu and turn into pages and check that out. You just created pages. Another cool thing, I think if I hold alt or option, I can uh, open up pages that are not in a database inside peak now, which is super useful. So that is literally how you would build a basic knowledge base. And uh, I'm not going to bore you by literally creating all of those pages, but this is sort of like, the end result. It's just a page with two columns and you have pages underneath headings. And this is a great place to start for teams. Seriously, like if you have nothing else but this, it will be a value add for your company. Um, this is actually how we started out with Notion. We were looking for company wiki software. We went through a bunch of different options. I wanted something that was like super easy to create uh, a new page. We at one point tried like I think we literally tried like Wikia or Wikimedia or something like that. Um, we tried WordPress and it just takes too long to create something. Uh, and it's, it's actually kind of astounding to me now to think back at just how annoying it was to create stuff like this before Notion. Now, like every app in the world has it. Slack has canvases, there's Slight, there's Coda, there's, uh, there's Confluence, all that kind of stuff. But like the ability to just, like, I just made these pages instantly and I can go in here and I can just easily type stuff and make stuff. So that is how you would make a very, very basic knowledge base. 
Uh, cool. So again, I'll just have this on screen one more time as a reference for people watching through the uh, replay. The next thing we're going to build here after I give this a cool little icon, because come on, we have to give it a cool icon. Let's do it a book. Um, and we could also give it a cover if we really wanted to. But after that, we're going to build a meeting notes database. So I'm going to go to change cover. Let's do unsplash. And uh, is it like old library? Maybe something that's like knowledge -y? Yeah, these look pretty good. These look pretty good. What's this one here? This one looks uh, pretty cool, I think, if it wants to load. Yeah, so we got, I don't know, spiral staircase with some old leather bound books and a lot of mahogany in my apartment. Got to have that. And boom, there you have a very basic knowledge base. And if you were diligent about building process documents, then you would have something incredibly useful for your company. Okay, step two, level two in this build guide is gonna be a meeting notes database. So once again, I'm gonna make a blank page. I like having blank pages that contain databases. You can just do a database, but I like having blank pages. So once again, I wanna make this full width. I'm gonna call this meeting notes. And this would be a great place for if your team does have infrequent meetings, you could send everyone the link to the meeting notes document and it would be super easy for everyone to take notes on that document. You can even give any, everyone their own section if you wanted to. Um, and it literally keeps everyone on the same page, pun intended. So meeting notes, let's give this like a pen icon. I think that looks good. And on here, I can create a database. So I'm gonna do slash database. We'll call it an inline database. I will call this meeting notes. So it's a meeting notes database inside a page called meeting notes. And the reason I like to have it in a page instead of as a full width database is if I wanted to do something down here or maybe up here, like a call out, I could do that. If I was a full width or full page database, I couldn't put additional blocks on here. So that's why I like to do that. I like to make my call outs a uh, default background and maybe give them like a, I don't know, a space invader icon. And then I could literally like write instructions for my team here. You know, that's very obvious, but there might be some specific instructions that you might want to put in here, like instructions on how to use it. You could even, here's a cool trick, enter down, tab in, dash, 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 and then instructions. If you wanted to put like a Loom video or something in a toggle like here, now there is no confusion if somebody lands on this page and they're not sure how to work it, which for Meeting Notes database is probably not going to be the case, but for a task manager or something like that might be the case. You could easily put instructions inside a toggle and that will help anybody who needs instructions on it to use it. You could even link to, with a double bracket, the knowledge base or a specific page in the knowledge base, and that would uh, give them a quick link to a specific piece of documentation on how this works. So in our meeting notes database, I think it might be useful to have a couple of different properties. So I'm gonna get rid of tags, but what I do wanna have here is a, a date one. So we'll call that the date of the meeting. And then I also wanna have a person property and uh, this could be for attendees. And you'll see why I'm gonna add this in a second. I wanna hide this database title here. And then what I think I wanna do is create a meeting notes template. So if I go back over to my actual uh, demo here and I go into meeting notes, I can actually show you why we have this. So if I go into team retreat planning here, actually I wanna show you the uh, Black Friday sale plan first, you'll see that we have a summary we have a list of action items and we have our actual notes along with a tasks table that we can open up. We can even add tasks to our task manager. We'll add that a little bit later. But uh, the reason why I wanna create a template is because we can actually add these in here. So if you have the Notion AI add-on, which is a paid add-on, you can even add it onto a free plan if you want to. Um, I think it's like eight bucks per month annually per user. So. I think it really only makes sense for teams that are gonna heavily leverage documentation with summarization. If that does uh, involve you or that does that is, does include you, then inside of a, uh, a notes page here, you can add what are called AI blocks. So I can add these as a template and they're gonna automatically be here. And after we take notes, I could just do this, summarize page of the AI. We're gonna get a summary. I could do find action items in this page, generate that, it's gonna create a nice little checklist of things we need to do. So uh, this is like a really, really basic note here, but for a big long meeting, planning out tons and tons of details for a team retreat, you might have tons of stuff here and the ability to just instantly create a checklist of action items could be very useful for certain teams. So we're gonna go ahead and build that little uh, template there. 
And the way we can do that is inside of our meeting notes database, we can go new template, just like that. Cool. And I'm gonna open that as a full width page. I'm gonna call this meeting template. Let me check the date thing. I wanna see if they added this. Oh my goodness, they did. Okay, this is actually cool. I need to remember, and maybe Marissa can take a note for me here. I need to remember to add this to my new Notion feature roundup video that I'm working on. I think I'm gonna call it like 30 Notion features I forgot to tell you about <laughs> or something like that. Uh, inside of a database template, we now have the ability to set a date property as now or today date when duplicated. That is so, so nice. I didn't know we had that yet. I'm so happy about that. Oh my goodness. I'm like irrationally excited about it. Okay, so I'm gonna set this as today, date when duplicated, and then attendees will be empty and we can start building out our little template here. So first thing I wanna do, slash TOC. That's a table of contents. As we add headings here, we'll be able to jump to those headings from the top of the page. I think it's pretty cool. I'm gonna do a uh, summary heading just like that. And then in here, if you do have the Notion AI add-on, you can type AI. And then after all of these different AI options, there's a few AI blocks. There is summary, action items, and custom AI block. Custom AI block just lets you write your own uh, prompt if you want. But I'll go with summary just like that. And then uh, I can do another one. And I will find the action items. So basically the reason I'm doing this is I'm creating a database template, which is gonna be applied to our new meeting notes going forward. So automatically I'm gonna have the summary and the find action AI blocks on the page. I can also add a notes section. This is just where I'll take my notes. And then later on in the build guide, I'm gonna come back in here and I'm gonna add a tasks dropdown. But for now we don't have a tasks uh, database yet. So we're not going to do that quite yet. So this will be our meeting notes template. We can now go back to our meeting notes page. And a cool thing we can do is go to this little blue arrow here, go to meeting template, and we can set this as a default for either this view or all views for this database. I'm gonna go with all views for this database because I intend this to be the only meeting notes template for now. And then say I delete all these and I create a new meeting note. Let's just call this um, Notion for Team Stream where I would be able to add all of you lovely folks as attendees if you were in my Notion workspace. Sorry, you're not, I'll just put myself and I don't know, I'll put Alex for now as well, maybe Marissa. Now, if I come in here, because I said it as the default, look at that, it's already here. I can take all my notes as needed. Uh, we talked about, we talked about databases and Pokemon. Cool. So there you have your Notion or your meeting notes uh, database template. Another thing that I think I wanna do here is the same trick that I demoed in the tasks and projects area where I wanna create a view of this table that only shows me notes where I was an attendee. So I'm gonna rename this to all notes. And then I'm gonna go ahead and duplicate it. And I'm gonna call this, uh, uh, let's see here, I attended. Sure. In the filters for this, I'm gonna create an advanced filter and you can do this with simple filters. I just like advanced filters better. And I'm gonna set a filter where attendee contains me, not Thomas Frank, but the keyword me. So again, if a different person in my workspace is looking at this view, the me filter is gonna to apply to them. But in this case, it applies to me personally. So now I'm only gonna see notes where I was an attendee. Let's say there was another one called a super secret meeting that Tom isn't invited to. And I want a, uh, a tongue out. This one doesn't look mean spirited enough, but there it is. Marissa's in there, Eli's in there, Ben's in there. Now, if I go to I attended, it's not there because my filter is only showing me the stuff where I was an attendee. And I think in general, this is a useful design pattern for team focused workspaces because what can happen as you add more and more stuff to a workspace over time, if you have these big dashboards, specific people on your team are gonna go, there's so much stuff here that isn't relevant to me, I'm overwhelmed. Well, if you create a nice little view like this, they're not gonna be overwhelmed because all they're gonna see is stuff that is relevant to them. So that is our meeting notes database. Pretty simple, not too hard. The next thing we're gonna do is take the database concept that we used here and we're gonna use it to upgrade our knowledge base. Because as you can see right now, this is just a bunch of pages. Uh, just like in IT, you have like JBOD, just a bunch of drives. This is just a bunch of pages. So what we wanna do 
is make this just a bunch of pages work a little bit better. Again, this is our finished knowledge base where we have linked database views for each section, and that allows us to sort those articles by date, by name, uh, we can even filter them. It just becomes a lot more useful in my opinion. So we're gonna do, we're gonna do that next. Um, I think this is like technically the halfway point of our build guide. Time-wise, it's probably not because this and the task manager are a little bit more complex than the first two things, but I am gonna take a quick break to answer a few questions because Marissa does have a few, I think that I have not um, covered yet. So let me again, take a quick drink break. And we'll see what Marissa has collected for me. Okay. Um, Mitchell Hahn says, hey, Thomas, have you gone over notifications? I'd love to use Notion to notify my team. The notifications don't seem reliable. Yeah, to be completely honest, uh, I don't rely on notifications at all. In fact, I'll go back to here. We can see I have 99 plus notifications <laughs> across my entire Notion account. Um, I really just don't use them that much. And that might come, to, that might be due to the fact that I'm really not a notification heavy person. I, I do have notifications in Slack and like messages, but beyond that, like I don't get, I don't have a badge for my email. I don't get notifications on my phone for email. I just go in and check. Um, so I've never really been incentivized personally to try to make use of notifications in Notion. That being said, we do have uh, plans to make content on how to best use them. And as I'm thinking about it, I think this would be a very, very useful thing to add in the Notion for Teams course. So maybe Marissa can note that down or maybe I can note it down. Um, in fact, I can just add it as a little notes section here. Wow, it, it sounds like the fire engine almost like stopped right outside of my <laughs> studio. The siren just went, bah, it's gone. Hopefully, it's not for me. All right, uh, notes for me. Notion for Teams. I want to make sure to add that as a note. Section on notifications. So yeah, I will uh, make sure that we cover that in the Notion for Teams course. Uh, but right now, yeah, I don't have a whole lot of great information on it because it's just not a feature I use very often. Uh, Salim says, Thomas, I've been building my Notion for years now, but I keep failing to continue using it. How to fix that? Did you come with this issue before? So how, how do you fix that issue? Um, I think it really comes down to the same exact thing that we talked about for Teams. Start with minimum viable product and get buy-in, in this case, not from your team, but from yourself. So I think about this a lot, right? You can be in two different modes of thinking. You can be in builder's mode and then you could be in execution mode where you have to actually use the systems you've built to do things. And this is not unique to Notion. I've gone through this problem with the simplest of apps like Todoist, remember the milk when I was in high school, stuff like little to-do managers where I just had a list of tasks and maybe some projects and then I wouldn't use it. The problem becomes if you let your systems become overwhelming, if you let your systems get crufty, as I like to say, then you're you're gonna stop relying on them and you're going to start using your head again. So a big thing you need is number one, simplicity in your systems, make it as simple as you need it to be or as advanced as you need it to be, but you also need a process for reviewing the system and making sure that it is up to date and it is cleared out of stuff that is no longer relevant to you. This is a huge reason why in Ultimate Brain, our template for personal productivity, we have an archive concept, it comes straight from Tiago Forte's para methodology. Archive is a safe place for stuff to go that is no longer relevant to you. It's not deleted, you can find it if you need to, but it's not showing anywhere else other than in the archive. So what that does is it keeps your system clean, it keeps you feeling like everything you're looking at is relevant and you're more likely to stick with the system you've built. Again, I will stress, this is not unique to Notion. This happens with all kinds of systems, be they digital, be they paper-based. I've been using productivity systems, you know, basically every tool under the sun since I was probably 13 or 14. Uh, I think that's when I found Remember the Milk maybe. And uh, you know, even if it's a paper notebook, if it gets messy, if you don't understand the context, if it feels irrelevant to your life, then you're gonna stop using it. So um, a really tactical tip I can give you is maybe make Sunday a review day where for like half an hour, you sit down, you review your systems, you archive stuff that's no longer uh, relevant, you check off tasks that you forget to check off, and then that's gonna keep your system working nice and smoothly. Cool. Uh, Austin says, is there a way to take a full page database and turn it easily into an inline database instead? or do you have to recreate that entire database? Austin, that is the easiest question that I will be asked in this entire stream. <laughs> so let me just show it to you really quickly. 
Uh, here I have my meeting notes database. This is inline. If I click the little six dot menu here, here's a, here's a button called turn into page. So now that's a full page database. If I go back, I can do the exact same thing. Click the six dot menu and turn into inline. That's all it is. So if you think about the data model of Notion, every single thing in Notion is a block, including pages and including databases. So I can often change anything into anything else. In fact, I don't know if this will let me, I can turn this into a page. Uh, because this is a database, I probably can't like turn it into like a header or something like that. But um, I can turn it into inline and then I think I could even turn it into, maybe not. Uh, sometimes you can turn databases into simple tables. But yeah, like another example, if I have a, a bullet list right here, and I want to turn this into a heading, turn into heading. That's because on the back end, it's just a block of information. It says, all right, what's the content of this block? It's the word bullet. What is the type of the block? Right now, it's uh, the of type bullet list. And you could just change it into a header, and that just changes on the back end. Now it's of type header one. That's it. All right. Um, Marissa says, how do you allow a user to enter info in the properties fields but not add or delete new rows in the database. I actually don't know if that's possible. Hmm. If Marissa knows the answer to that question, maybe she can put it in the chat, but I don't know if that's actually possible because I think if you have can edit permission on a database uh, or can edit content, they're going to be able to change the contents. Um, yeah, I think the only way you could do that now that I'm thinking about it is you would, you would go into the database itself. So here I'm on a full page database and I would go to my permissions here. Um, let's find Eli. I'm going to set Eli to can view for this database. Cool. I don't want to add him to the workspace. I'll skip for now and keep him as a guest. So Eli can view this database. Now he could go into any of these pages, but he has view only access. He couldn't change anything. Now, let's say I want him to be able to change the content of the super secret meeting that Tom isn't invited to. I can open that. And because this is a page that exists inside the database, it's its own page. It has its own set of permissions. And again, we talked about the permissions cascade. Since I set uh, permissions in the database, then Eli has access based on those database permissions. You can see right there, if I try to mouse over it'll go away, but this access is based on meeting notes. So I can change his access on this individual page to can edit. So now Eli would be able to edit these properties, edit the page con down, down, content down here. But again, if I go back to meeting notes and I check out share, he still has can view access. So that is the way you would do it. Um, I don't think there's a way where you could say like, uh, a person has edit access to all pages in this database that already exist, but then can't edit or can't create new ones or delete new ones or delete them. And I think because he has can edit, he could even delete this page. So I think what you're asking for is not quite possible, but that is about the closest we can get to it. Uh, okay. So I think that might've been the last question here. I think, uh, Lucy is still asking some stuff. Um, oh, and Austin saying, right. But if it started as a full page, can you turn it into an inline database view? Oh, okay. Austin, I think what you're asking here is if I have a full page database at top level, can I do that? So here in the stream demo, let's do that. Let's um, create a blank page at the top level of stream demo. We'll call it a table. So it's an actual new database, new database. So you're asking me if I could turn this full page top level database into a page and or into an inline database. So basically what I would need to do is move this into a page so it could be viewed as inline. Because basically if you think about it, if this is top level, then there's nothing above it for it to be displayed in line. So again, we're thinking about like Notion's block model, right? Pages are blocks, databases are blocks. So if a block is going to be displayed somewhere, then it needs to be within another block where we can display it. And if it's top level, then the block isn't contained by any other block. Again, pages are blocks. Right now, this new database is not contained by anything. It's just top level. So if I wanna make that in line, let me just create myself a page here, call this new page. Now I'll pop database into new page. And now I can go ahead and turn to inline. So again, you wouldn't have to recreate the database. Just make sure to drop it into a page. So it is being contained by something that creates a canvas on which it can be displayed. And then you will be able to turn it into an inline database. 
Okay. A couple more questions. I have a page with sub pages in the left margin. How do I convert the parent page to a database with all sub pages as records? That's actually an interesting idea. Um, I think what I would actually recommend doing, so I can literally demonstrate this as well. So they're saying I have a page here. Let's get rid of this database. And I have some other pages here. So let's call this page one, page two, page three. And they're asking if these are pages, which I will turn into pages right now, contained by a parent page, could I convert this parent page into a database where these are the records? Um, and I don't think you can. Let's see, turn into, nope, I can turn it into a team space. I can turn it into a wiki. Can't turn it into a database because it's top level. But again, if I make it not top level, then I might be able to do it, or I probably can do a trick that will enable me to not do it. So let me create one more new page. We'll call this container page. Now I can drag new page into it. And now a new page is right there. Now let's see if we can turn it into a database. I don't know if we'll be able to, but I'll look. We can't. So instead, what we want to do is get access to those pages. Here's a cool trick. If I turn this new page into a heading, there's all those pages. And then I'll just create a database. I'll call it new database. And now the way I can make these records of the database is by highlighting them, dragging them, make sure that I'm not dropping them into one of these existing rows, but instead getting this thinner line. So I'm actually dragging them in as new rows. And there they are. Now they're records in this database. And I can just get rid of this new page. So I guess the short answer is you can't really convert a page to a database, but you could easily just create a database and drop the pages into it. All right. Um, Lucia says, what's the best way to create a navigation menu for people who aren't members, only guest access, so they don't get the full team space view in the sidebar? Um, that might be a bigger question than I have time to go over in the stream right now. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I mean, I think like people who have guest access, they're gonna see what they have access to in their sidebar. And I, I think it's gonna be in a shared area right down here. So if they have guest access to stuff, they're just gonna see that. And then again, if you were to upgrade to the business plan and notion, you could set your team space settings right there to um, private so they wouldn't see it, but you would have to upgrade to the business plan. And then your, your guests would see the pages they have shared with them in the shared section right here. So really no way to um, change that. I think I can click to hide it. I can open it, share it. That's about it. Uh, Salim says, I want to suggest a video since you are planning to be the go-to channel in notion. The idea is drag and drop pages that already have properties, but you made a button that creates the pages. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll take a look at that a little bit later. And I think for now we're going to go back to our build guide here. So we already built our very simple knowledge base. One little thing I want to do here is actually go up to my page customization settings and turn off those backlinks. I don't like them. And that's a trick I use all the time for um, bigger bigger pages like database pages or, um, or dashboard pages. I turn the backlinks off because they're sort of just supposed to be destinations for lots of things. And I don't wanna see all those backlinks there. So what we're gonna do in this section of the build guide is we're going to take this knowledge base from being just a bunch of pages and we're gonna turn it into this nicer, more organized knowledge base where we have a full database of all of our pages and then we're kind of creating linked views where we can actually sort and filter to make it much more useful. So to do that, I'm gonna come down here. I'm gonna make a toggle. So a little uh, shift period to create that little bracket space that creates a toggle. I'm gonna call this databases. And I wanna call, put my databases in there. I'm also going to, I think, create a new full width block and dash, dash, dash to create a divider. This looks a little nicer. So in here, I'm gonna create a database make it inline for now. And I'm going to call this um, KB articles for knowledge base articles. I'm going to get rid of my tag section and I'm going to add a select property, which I will call section. So in here, I can create sections like business admin. I could create one like tech reference. Um, what else do we have in terms of sections? We have announcements and customer service. So we'll do those two. And announcements could maybe even be its own database. In fact, maybe I will make it its own database because it's going to be kind of different. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that one. We'll just have those three for now. I'm also going to add a created by 
So I know who created the property or the page, and then I'm gonna add a person property, and I'm gonna call that maintainer. And this I think is useful because you might have uh, instances where somebody in your company makes a page, maybe then they leave the company and you hire somebody else and then they become the person who's supposed to maintain the documentation. You could say like, okay, well for this, Alex is the maintainer. For this one, uh, Marissa is the maintainer. Cool. So we have our sections, we have created by, we have maintainer. Let's take a look at what else we have, if anything. Uh, last edited, that's about it. So we could add that if we wanted to. Cool. And now we have the structure we need to start creating linked database views. So instead of these, which I will keep for now, we could enter down from say business admin, maybe I'll make a divider, and then we could do slash list. So if we do last view, a list view, we can make a linked database view of our KB articles database. I'll do a new empty view just like that. And that creates a nice little compact list view. I'm going to hide my database title. And then the most important thing here is that I filter by the section and I want the section to be business admin. And that's it. Maybe I'll also sort by uh, name in ascending order. So now what I can do is drag this page that I had just sitting here into my linked view. I won't remove my sorting. And now it's a page in that database. If I come down here, I see new, new, team, uh, new team member onboarding as a page in the database, check that out. I'll delete these blank ones. And I've kind of created this list already. So let me go ahead and rename it to business admin. And if you watched my previous stream, you'll know that I am a fan of reducing effort. So instead of just remaking this, now that I have this all set up, and maybe I want to set my load limit as well to 10 pages, just so if we have a lot of pages in here, they aren't all showing at once. I can now click this little six dot button right here, click away. So the entire database is selected. I'm going to actually, I don't have to do that. I can hold option or alt and literally just click and drag that six to create a copy of it. So let me enter down. And then the only thing we have to do here is change the name of this view to announce, actually wait, announcements will have its own database. So never mind, we won't put it there. We'll put it down here in customer service and we'll make a customer service view. So again, hopefully you can see where this is going. We're just making filtered views of a single database where we're filtering by the section. So this one will be customer service. Let's change the filter to section is customer service, not business admin. We'll save for everyone. We're in a workspace with multiple members. So we do have to save the filters for everyone because you can change filters for yourself um, that won't apply to other people until you click that button. And then we can do the same thing. We can just drag these articles in here just like that. Don't remove our sorting. And we do the same thing for tech reference. Dash, dash, dash. Rename this bad boy a tech reference or whatever you wanted to name it. You can name it dinosaur chicken nuggets for all I care. But what's important is that you change your filter to tech reference. And now maybe we have an article like, um, or actually we just add pages directly now, uh, you know, converting MP4 to MP3 and we create that kind of thing. Another database we might create, and maybe we'll actually turn this KB articles into a full page database now is an announcements database. So one more time, database, inline, they call it announcements. And this would be good for, you know, little announcements for your team. So like say Marissa was planning a team retreat for us uh, earlier this year, which we did in Seattle in uh, August, it went amazingly well. So she would have had announcements like, um, you know, vote on the uh, accommodations or uh, vote on the different things we're gonna do, like the announcement blog post almost for that. And she could even have like a survey in there with tally or something like that. So we'll have an announcements blog post uh, database. I'm going to give it a single property of date so we can set a manual date for it. Let's go ahead and delete these default rows. We don't need them, turn that into a page. And we can do the same thing that we did before up in announcements. I'm gonna create a list view, find announcements, make a new empty view, hit done. And then I think what I'll do is hide the database title, sort by date in descending order. So the most recent announcement is there up front. We can make a new one just as an example, team retreat details. And we could even give it a date, uh, which we actually need to show that property. So view options, I'll go to properties, show a date. Now, if I edit it, I could add a date. And let's say it was the 8th of August. 
Cool. So we're getting a lot more useful here. We're basically done with the actual knowledge base. The last thing I wanna show you here on the knowledge base build out is how we can actually uh, start to create database templates that will help in creating better documentation. And I kind of already showed this in the section on the uh, meeting notes database, but I'll show it to you here too. So we can actually go into our database and sort of show what it looks like. I have a technical reference database template right here. If I edit it, we can see what it looks like. We've got document verification status. Uh, this is actually something that's built into the wiki feature. But again, as I told you, I don't love the wiki feature. So I sort of just built my own. And then we have table of contents, summary, action items, and a full article. Pretty easy. So the way we would create that is any of these views will do. We can go into the little blue arrow, make a new template just like that. I'm going to call this our tech reference template. And then Beneath here, we've got created by, we've got last at a time. We're all good for, to go for that. Because it's tech reference, I'm going to give it a default section of tech reference. And then in here, we could start to create our template content. So I'm going to start with a TOC, table of contents. Let's go ahead and hide that sidebar to give you some more view uh, room to see this. Um, and then down here, maybe I'll make a heading for summaries, our summary, and I'll create an AI block. Again, this requires the Notion AI add-on. So if you don't have it, then you could ignore this part but I'm gonna just do it because I do have Notion AI. Action items. I do think that this is particularly useful for technical documentation. Uh, and I'll show you in a second the action items specifically and how useful it is. And then here I'll do full process. So that will be my template. Again, I can set this as a default. And then if I need to make a technical reference article, I'm just gonna see it automatically come in like this. If I go back to my knowledge base, Let's go ahead and go to the tech reference section and we will set this tech reference uh, template as a default, but only for the tech referenced view. I realized I didn't get the D off there apparently. Let me change that quickly. There we go. So now when I make a new article like that, tech reference, let's just call it, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get a good article to actually bring in here and show you. Uh, 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 here we go, converting audio files with FFmpeg. Now, when I come in, I've got all my stuff. So let me show you why these are so useful. Let's say I've written up this really long technical article about converting audio files with FFmpeg, which is a command line tool for converting um, audio or video files to different formats. If you wanna like convert video to audio, you can do it that way. It's super duper useful. So now that I have this, you can tell that this is a lot of information. It might be overwhelming and it might be too much for someone on your team who's just like, oh, I forgot the command in the command line. What is that command? Well, if I go to summary, I can just generate a summary just like that. If I go to action items, I can generate action items just like that. And I wanna show you a trick here. These action items are fairly useful. Check if homebrew is installed, install homebrew if not, check if FFmega is installed, install if not, navigate to the video file. But what might be really useful is to be able to see the command right at a glance. So this gets generated using a default prompt on the back end. But if I wanna change it, I can do that just by clicking right here. I can ask it to write anything. And let's just say um, generate a, and my typing is terrible. So sorry about that. Generate a uh, list, uh, I'll put a checklist. Checklist of action items from this page, including any relevant command line commands. So if we do this, now we're specifically asking for those commands. Let's see if it gives us something a bit more helpful. There we go. This is much better. So again, if I'm on the Thomas Frank team and I've been assigned to go through and actually convert some audio files or video files, I can just see an action items. Oh, there it is. There's the command I needed. FFmpeg dash I blah, 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 blah. And if I really need to know how to do this, then I can go look at the entire process. So that is our knowledge base basically done. We have a template in there. You could make multiple templates if you want. Another thing that I will note you can do, I've already shown database construction in the stream enough, but another thing I'll note you can do is you can literally put databases inside of other pages. So for example, in our knowledge base, we have a section called gear and tools where we have like a gear list for all of our camera gear, lighting, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we have a songs for videos list and we have a software and SaaS apps. So inside that page, I've just created a custom database specifically for software licenses. 
So if we buy a piece of software, like we bought Screen Studio really recently, um, we got a license key for that. We put the license key in this database because if I have a team member who gets a new computer, this just happened to Marissa recently, um, she's gonna need to go and install some software and she might need license keys. So it's good to have that kind of database in there. Again, a database can go inside of a page and you can go as many layers deep as you want until you meet the turtles on which the earth stands upon. It's turtles all the way down, my friends. Okay, so the last part of the stream we're gonna go through is building our tasks and projects template here. This will be um, the more involved one of the four. And again, uh, like I said earlier at the beginning of the stream, I don't think every single team in the world should be doing task and project management inside of Notion, especially if say you're like running a big engineering team and you need like linear or something like that. Um, but if it's a simple team, I think Notion can work really well for task and project management. And it does have the big benefit of you being able to very easily say, go into a task's details and link to a note or link to a process document or anything like that. And they could just instantly go to it. So we do our task and project management inside of Notion. And uh, I'm going to assume that you want to as well, if you're gonna hang out with this stream. Uh, let's see here if there's anything in terms of questions that we can answer until or before we go into the last part of this build guide. Uh, Shelty Cousin says, can I, how can I convert the action item list generated by AI into my task list that appears on my task list page? I will show you that uh, a little bit later in the stream because we're actually going to go as part of this build process. We're going to add a task database view to our meeting notes template. And then you'll be able to see how we can actually drag items from our AI list into our task database. Cool. So if there are any other questions, pop them in the chat while I take a quick speaking break. <laughs> One person says, uh, you are so freaking fast. I don't know if that's a compliment or, or a non-compliment, but. <laughs> I try to go to a good clip. Um, this is the third stream we've done so far. And I think we're on pace to be right around the same two and a half to three hour mark. So I don't know if that's just me and how much I talk or if that's just how much people tend to stream. Yeah, I guess what we're getting is a three hour streams basically. Okay, so I've taken a drink. I think we're ready to go into this last build project. As a reminder, what we're building here is a task and project management section. So we have a project manager here where we can see in progress, not started and done projects. We have a task area where we can see all of our tasks in a nice little board view. We can see them split out by project as well. We can see any tasks due this week as well as unassigned tasks. We can go into a sample uh, project and we can see all the tasks that are related to that project. And then we last and definitely not least have a assigned to me page where I'm only gonna see the tasks that are assigned to me kind of in the same views, but this gives me as a member of a team, a, a kind of centralized dashboard to see all the tasks related to me and everyone on the team can actually share this because the filter shows them only what's relevant to them. Cool. So let's start building my friends. Back open with the command backslash with style. We're gonna go into our stream demo team space, make one more page here, call it a blank page, and this is gonna be called tasks and projects. Check that out. Uh, one thing I will also note is Notion has actually built some built-in templates. So if you don't wanna build this yourself, um, you can go to plus right here and you can see they have suggested templates. So if I did projects and tasks, that just adds that almost instantly. It's not quite the same thing that we're going to be building here. We don't have that assigned to me thing, but we do have a project dashboard and a task dashboard. So you could generate that. And if, if you're the kind of person who just likes to be given something, then that might be an even faster way to do this. I'm going to assume anybody who is showing up for a notion stream is also the kind of person who wants to fully understand what they're building. Um, and wants to like build it themselves. So we're gonna be building it ourselves, but I just wanted to note that as a little aside. So tasks and projects, I'm gonna make that once again, full width. And then let's enter down a couple. We're gonna make a couple of databases. So let's create that toggle. And <laughs> why did I call it toggle? <laughs> I have, I'm two hour and 15 minute into stream brain. That's why I called it the toggle toggle. Let's call it databases. And this is gonna be two databases that we're gonna work with here. So. First and foremost, we're gonna create a tasks database. I'll do database inline, call this tasks. And then what should a task database have? Well, it should have a few properties like status. It should have assignee. It should have um, 
maybe a due date, but it should also have a relation to a projects database. So we're first going to create a projects database as well. Database in line one more time, projects. And now I'm gonna get rid of these tags properties. I kind of wish that they didn't come in by default. I just want the name property. Let's start building out our set of properties. First and foremost, let's make that relation. And I have a whole, uh, I'll point out on Thomas Frank Explains, I have a whole video, Notion Databases, full course for beginners. If you wanna understand relations in that video, there are full timestamps and there is even a relations section in here somewhere. Is it 24 minutes in? So if you really wanna understand relations, check that out um, or check out the companion article in the description. There's a full article as well. But we are just going to build that relation. It's gonna relate our task database to our projects database. So if I, if I pick project right there, I'm gonna call it project. I only want one. I do wanna show on projects. I'll call it tasks. And you can see here that we have a diagram of what this is doing. It is creating a property on my tasks database called project, which points to my projects database, and then vice versa, that's gonna have a property called tasks pointing to tasks. And that allows us to relate different rows together. So for instance, if I have a project row, I might wanna have some tasks that are related to that project. So I'll add the relation. And now if I create a project like um, rebuild the studio again, maybe I have uh, mount the lights, Kick out Deadpool, he keeps sleeping on the couch. Um, get new rug, also Deadpool's fault. Now I can relate these to the Rebuild the Studio project. And you can see they're coming in just like that. Now this is currently not very useful, but what it's gonna allow us to do is go into our project page and see all those tasks down here in a nice little view in just a second. So let's go ahead and create our other relevant properties. So for a tasks database, we probably want a status property. And I think the default options of not started in progress and done are totally fine for our simple purposes. Again, we're trying to keep things simple. We might want a person property for assignee. So maybe kick out Deadpool. That's gonna be, uh, that's my job. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do it, but that's my job. Mount the lights, I'm giving that to Ben. Get the new rug, Marissa can do that. And then uh, let's see here, due date. How about a due date? So date, call it due. Cool. Let's check our reference to see if there's anything else we need. Project status, assignee, due. Note, we'll add a little bit later. So that's it. As for projects, we might wanna have another person property, which we'll call lead. So who's the project lead? Who's the person that I need to ping on Slack if I have a question about this project? And then we'll also have status. And I think that's all we need for our projects as well. So now maybe I turn these into pages like I've been doing. We can start to actually build up the dashboard. So first I'll create a heading one for projects. And here I'm gonna create, uh, I think a gallery view. I think I used gallery. So if I do uh, projects database, I'm gonna make a linked view of the projects database just like that. New empty view, we'll bring a gallery in there and then I can go ahead and make some tweaks here. Card preview, maybe if we added a page cover, we could add that. So I'll go ahead and do that just to make it look nice. I'm gonna set my size to small, wrap properties. And I like to open my projects inside Peak. They default to uh, center for gallery views, but I don't really like that. So I'm gonna go with that. There's our project view, but if we look at, our original one, we wanna see our progress and we wanna see only in progress projects here, then switch over to not started, switch over to them. So it does uh, it does seem that I forgot to bring in uh, that progress property. So I'll go ahead and make that here. You can go ahead and make that in a page. If you add a property, this will add it to the entire database. And for that, it's gonna be a rollup. I'm gonna call it progress. And basically a rollup reaches through a relation to access a property of those related rows. In this case, I want it to be status. And if I choose a status type property, I can actually do percent per group and I'm gonna do percent per group complete. So right now it's zero. Um, another thing I can do because I am outputting a number here, I can edit this property and I can actually show it as a bar graph, which is pretty cool. And then if I say mark off some of these tasks as part of this project, so let's just set uh, mount the lights to done. Now, if I come back here, and I go to view properties 
and show my progress, check that out, 33%. And maybe let's give it a cover image as well. So it shows up there. Maybe a little bit better one, like a TV studio. That looks pretty good. Yeah. I like images of it. I think that looks pretty cool. And then uh, to finish up this little projects area, let's go ahead and create a filter. I'm going to add an advanced filter just like that. I'm going to say uh, status is in progress. And I'm choosing the group here, not just the option, the full group that comes in as default. And then I want to actually give this a name as well. So we'll call it in progress. And again, once we have everything sort of set here, we can just duplicate our views to cut down on work. So I'll set this one to not started. Call it not started, adjust the filter just like that. Now that one is only filtering for not started projects, which apparently is this one. We can set this one to in progress if we want to. And now we see that it's back here. And maybe Rebuild the Studio is led by me. And we can duplicate one more time, call this one done, and adjust our filter as needed. So now we have our project view. The next thing we can do is create a task view, or we could uh, finish up projects by making the project template. So maybe I'll do that first. Within our project view, I can create a new template. We're just gonna call this project template. Nothing here needs a default status or view or anything. So I'm gonna leave that blank. I'll make this full width. And then in here, what I wanna do is basically create a filtered view of my tasks database that only shows me tasks related to this project. So we covered this in my note-taking system stream if you caught it already, um, but I'll show it here. Let's do a uh, table view actually. If I, if I pick my tasks table as, or my task database as my source here, I'll create a new empty view just like that. Um, let's call it table, I guess. And then what we can actually do is go into our filters. This is the most important part. We'll set uh, where project contains project template. So because we're adding this to a template, when I create a new project like Studio Redesign and I apply this template, this filter is gonna get updated to rebuild the studio again. And I'll show you that in a second, demonstrate it. Uh, what I think I'll also do is set grouping here and I'm gonna group by status. You can see here, this actually groups now by these statuses uh, and I can easily collapse them if I want to, which is pretty nice. And I think the last thing I'll do is sort by due date in, dis in uh, descending, no, ascending or descending? I think ascending is what I wanna do. Cool, so now I'm gonna see tasks by their status in uh, ascending due date order. I don't think I need to show the project because we're literally on a project page, um, but everything else I might wanna see here. And then I'm gonna go ahead and I think duplicate this, but I'm gonna call this one board. I'm just gonna duplicate this so I keep my uh, filter there. I'll change my layout to board just like that. And then we can actually change different settings of our board here. I do wanna color the columns. I think it looks a little bit nicer. Opening pages and side beak, that sounds perfectly fine. And uh, properties, are there any we wanna show here? Assignee, I think yes. Do, yes. And the rest, we don't have to do status. We're kind of showing with the Kanban columns. Project is obvious, we're on the project page. And then uh, one other view I wanna add here is one that is specifically for me, the person looking at the page. So I think I'll make that a table as well. Let's duplicate this. Let's call it my tasks. And the only thing we have to do here is add one more filter. And that filter is gonna be where assignee contains me. And again, we're using the me keyword. So if Marissa comes in and is looking at this page, she will see the ones assigned to her. If Ben comes in, he'll see his tasks. I see my tasks. Save for everyone. And I think that will do it for this project template. So now, if I go back to our little tasks and projects dashboard, which needs an icon, what am I doing? What am I doing? Let's do a checkbox here, just like that. Not the $8 a month checkbox, just a regular checkbox. Uh, now, if I come in here, I can apply the project template and we will see here are all the tasks for this project. I can zoom in a bit more to show you all of them. And if I go to my tasks, I only see the one assigned to me. Board shows me all of them, which is pretty nice. 
Another thing I might wanna do is because I can already see all my tasks down here in a more useful context, maybe seeing them here isn't super useful. So let's go ahead and uh, property visibility is set to always hide. That's a little bit nicer. Cool. Let's truck right along by creating our tasks section. So I'm gonna do slash one more time. We'll call this tasks and we're gonna create a board view. So slash board view, choose tasks as our source database, a new empty view. And then uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this database title right here. And then let's go ahead and come into properties and show the properties that are useful here. So assignee is good, due date is good, project is good here because we have a full tasks view. And then status we don't need because we're showing that via the Kanban views uh, columns here. In grouping, I want to color my columns. I think that's a nice little aesthetic touch. And then I'm gonna go ahead and sort by due in ascending order. I don't think any of these have due dates right now. So let's add a due date, say that one's due today. Um, get the new rug is due, it's overdue actually. It was due on the seventh and mount the lights is already done. But let's just say it was supposed to be due next week and Ben was really on it. Okay, so that gives us our tasks board view. Um, and what did I call it? Did I call it all tasks? I think I did. Yeah, so we'll just call it all tasks instead of board. Now, again, to save myself some effort, I can just duplicate like that. And I'm going to create a by project view. And the only difference here that I'm adding is in subgrouping, I'm going to add project as a subgroup. And what you can see, this creates what are called swim lanes. So I have my typical Kanban board that are going uh, in, in the descending order here, or I guess in the, whatever this, call, this is called, uh, not started in progress done. But I also have these horizontal rows that are representing each of the projects in my system. So I can close them, I can open them up, and this is just like another nice way, if you're the project manager in your company, you can easily see everything going on by project. I also had this week and unassigned, so let's create that really quickly too. So I'm gonna go ahead and make another table view. Again, tasks is my data, is my data source. We'll call this this week. Just like that. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and not wrap all columns, but I am going to wrap the name column just like that. Um, and a cool little trick, you can also freeze up to this column. So say I had a lot of columns here in this table view. Now, if I hold shift and scroll, that's frozen to the side, which is a pretty cool little feature. Pretty sweet. And uh, because we're creating a this week view, it's going to be powered by a filter. So if I create a filter, again, I love advanced filters. You don't have to use them. Uh, we're gonna say the filter is due, and this actually sets it up by default for us. The start date relative to day is this week. So anything due this week is gonna be showing in this view. You will notice that Ben's project or Mount the Lights, Ben's task Mount the Lights is not there because that is actually scheduled for next week. If we wanted to, we could create a next week view if we really wanted to, so how about next week? If you wanted to look ahead, just change your filter, next. And now I can see Ben's. For whatever reason, I can see this one as well, even though it's for Friday. So I'm not sure if it's counting seven days relative to today in either direction, because it doesn't seem to be going to next week, but it does now let me look ahead, which is pretty cool. And maybe I will sort by due date in ascending order, just like that. Same thing over here. The last one I wanna create here is an unassigned tasks view. So this would be for somebody who's like a project manager in the company. Uh, in our company, this would probably be like Marissa's view. And this would just show us any tasks that don't have an assignee. So changing my filters here, instead of the do filter, which I will remove, I'm going to add a filter where assignee is empty. So let's say we have another project task here. This one is, um, I don't know, dust the microphones. <laughs> They're so dusty. I keep breathing in microphone dust. Uh, this is unassigned. So it would be here in this unassigned view. So that my friends is tasks. And then to finish up this build, we're just going to create the assigned to me page. So I'll do slash page, assigned to me, just like that. Uh, let's get a little icon, like a person. I think that's pretty good. Full width. And then here, I think I'll create a call out. And I'm just gonna copy the text from the assigned to me call out over here. This I think would be useful to have, again, if you're building a workspace for a whole team, 
This is going to be a page meant for each team member to use as sort of their dashboard to show them their tasks. So having a little bit of explanation here is useful context for making sure, again, your team is on the same page. Down here, I'm going to do a slash 2C for a couple of columns. And in this section, I'm going to say my tasks. And then over here, slash 1, I'm going to do projects I lead. So what we can actually do is save ourselves some effort one more time by copying one of these views. So I'm going to go ahead and click that, click away, Command C, Control C on Windows. Now I've copied this entire linked database block. I can go into Assign to Me and I can paste it. And I don't want to paste in sync because I want to make changes to it. So I'm going to hit Dismiss right here. I think I'll move this over just a little bit for now. And all I need to do is add a filter to each of these views where Assignee contains me. That's it. Signee contains me. This week, Signee contains me. Oops. And maybe I don't need the next week view. I'll get rid of that. And I definitely don't need the unassigned view because again, anything on this page should have an assignee already. So we're good there. Uh, and the only other thing we need to do is add this projects I lead section. I'm super zoomed in because of the stream. So the fact that it's a two column layout here doesn't look amazing, uh, but on a normal computer, I think it looks pretty good as two columns. And to make it look better here, I could go to my layout and change my card size to small. Now it actually all fits. So again, projects, we can do the same thing here. We can go grab our uh, projects linked database here, Command C to copy it. I'll paste it here and I'm going to dismiss there. I think I'm going to go ahead and open this as a full page and sort of do some work on here. So instead of being a gallery view, I think here on this page, I will show it as a list view, just like that. And then again, I can filter where uh, the lead contains me, just like that. And if I wanted to have all those tabs, I could do the exact same thing right there. However, if this is a page where I'm just trying to see what's actually in progress right now, maybe I only need in progress. That's kind of up to you. So I've got that built. Now here, it looks really nice. I can open it up. I can see all the tasks. If I'm leading the project, maybe I want to go in and actually see what each other person is supposed to be doing. Or if I wanted to see only my tasks per that project, I could do that very easily as well. So that is a task management system. Again, it's plain, it's simple. It doesn't have GTD, it doesn't have recurring tasks, it doesn't have subtasks. And in my opinion, if you're working with a team, you do not need those things and they probably are going to work to your detriment as you're trying to onboard your team, get that buy-in, and make Notion a destination that people actually enjoy using. Again, that is the key. Build systems that are simple, useful, and a joy to use, so that way people start to get used to using them, they don't resist it, and they don't start branching off to their own systems that they like better that keep things scattered because that's what kills team communication and organization is when information gets scattered into silos where only one person can find it um, and no one else knows what's going on. So that was our build. I think we finished it up. Hopefully you found it helpful. I'm going to answer questions uh, and then we will end the stream and I will go eat food. So I think Marissa has um, grabbed a few more questions for me here. I'm going to go through them really quickly after I take a drink one more time. Again, I've been talking for two hours. I've been falling for 30 minutes. Uh, Legendary Promo TV says, if you use the new formula feature instead of a rollup on a page for your team to see, but you didn't share the main database to that user, can they still see the rolled up data? I'm trying to find a, a way to hide certain data from other users without having to create a separate page and database with basically duplicated data but disregarding sensitive data. So yes, um, a person needs to have in, uh, access to a database to see roll up data from that database, but there are still some, uh, there's still some like problems that can happen with that. So yeah, you can work with that. Um, but I think it really comes down to database access. One thing I would really like to see from Notion in the future is the ability to not only uh, set like row level permissions 
for database pages, like only show Marissa the pages she is assigned to, but I also wanna set permissions for properties. For example, in Nebula, uh, we have like a whole productions database and there might be a property for like the budget for the production. Some people shouldn't see the budget for the production, but they should see the release date for the production or something like that, right? So what I would love is the ability to set permissions based on properties as well. So somebody could see like, here's information about this, but you don't get to see the budget. You don't get to see like other sensitive information like that. Uh, Shayla says, just jumped in, but is there a way to set up a formula in a database that can highlight a certain item if a checkbox is checked or a word urgent is found in a summary by changing color or notifying? Um, I think Shayla's asking if we can like use a formula that is dependent on page content. Um, and I don't, think we can. So basically you can use a formula that brings in other, other properties of that database, but you can't really have a formula get context about the content of a page. So if you really wanted to get content about a page and um, contextualize that, you would want to use the API for that. I'm going to be doing a stream probably next week on working with the Notion API with Pipedream, which is my favorite automation builder tool. We'll go from no code to code. Um, so you could look into that. I think it might be a little bit complex for this use case, but it is possible. So I do want to note it. And yeah, for, with formulas, I don't think it's possible yet. Tom says, Hey, I'm, my name's Tom too. Hi, Tom. Uh, when creating a template for a project, what's the best way to add a bunch of tasks that is needed for every project without the task having a link to the template project? I will show you that. That's actually a pretty cool thing to show. Let's hop back over to the screen here. So what Tom is asking is if I create a new project and say it's um, like a video I have to make, there's gonna be default tasks for that project. And we just wanna generate them by default, right? So edit the video, write the script, publish the video to YouTube. Those are, those are tasks that are gonna be related to every single project. How would we make those uh, come in by default? There's a couple of different ways to do it. Um, I think I can show both of them in this workspace because I am using a paid workspace. So let's actually do that. So the first one is status automations. So if I go into automations here in the view options menu, I can create an automation menu and let me just call this um, video default tasks. For pages and projects, when a new page is added and it looks like right now we don't have the ability to filter by like a new page being added with a specific template. So right now with the status automations or database automations, it's just like any page is gonna be added, we're gonna do something. But when any page is added here, we can add an action. And one of those actions could be add page to tasks. So let's just say um, film video is the name of the task. We would edit a property and that would be the project. And we want to say this page, which is the page that is being created. And then we could do that again if we want to as many times as we needed to. So let's do another one, add pages to tasks. We'll call this one uh, edit video. Same difference there, project is this page. And I'll hit create now. So whenever I create a new project, let's call this, um, I don't know, my fun video. And I generate from my template, I should see my tasks in there by default. There they are edit video, film video. And if I open up edit video, you can see the project is my fun video. So that's how to do it with database automations. One thing I will note, uh, database automations are a paid feature. So you have to be on a paid notion plan to actually use that feature. If you duplicate a template that has automations, you can use them, but you can't edit them and you can't create new ones. Uh, and I have a whole video on those automations on my channel. So check that out if you're curious. The other way to do it is with a button. So if we say go into our project template, which I do wanna set as default actually, uh, I can go into this project template. And if I created a button, I could actually basically make those default tasks with a button. So slash button like that. Let's just call it create default tasks or create video tasks. How about that? Give it a fun little icon. And then when the button is clicked, again, add page to our tasks database, just like that. Maybe this one's called edit video. We would edit another property and make sure the project is this page. And then we could do the exact same thing. Can we duplicate yet? We can duplicate below. Look at that. Film video. Now, one thing we can't really do is dynamically set a date property based on the date of the project. You could use a formula for that, but it wouldn't be like an actual date property. Well, we can just create this uh, list of tasks here. Well, this one published to YouTube just like that. 
and we'll hit done. So now if I come into a project, uh, rebuild the studio again, and I'm gonna go ahead and actually delete this. I'm gonna delete this um, link to database view so I can get a blank page and regenerate from my project template. Now, if I hit create video tasks, look at that. As many times as I want, they all come in. So those are currently the two main ways that you would do this. The other way could be with the API, but again, that is um, a lot more technical and involved, but those two ways do work pretty well. Um, Lucia says, I figured out a way to set the date as an offset based, uh, offset based on the project date. So what I would ask Lucia is, are you using a formula for that? Because we can definitely use a formula for it. The only problem is it doesn't become an actual, do like a date property that we can change if we need to. So as far as I know, we would have to use the, um, the API for it. But if you know a different way, let me know. I don't see if there's any other, I think that was the last question. That was Tom's question. I don't see any more from Marissa. So yeah, that might be it. We're at two hours and 40 minutes. I mean, I didn't know if this stream would go as long as the previous ones, but it did indeed. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna start wrapping things up. And uh, if there are more questions that come in, please add more questions. I will ask, I will answer them before we uh, actually end the stream, but I'm gonna start wrapping things up. Um, we, number one, have an interest form for the Notion for Teams course that we are gonna be building that will probably launch in 2024. I'm gonna post that in the chat one more time. So if you are working with a team and you have interest in uh, that course, pop in the chat right now, Notion for Teams course and consulting form. Yeah, so if you're interested in that, we've got a little tally form where you can uh, fill out a survey. We're gonna be launching a course in 2024 for uh, teams that wanna use Notion. It'll be basically like a beefed up more in depth version of this with support. And then we also will have uh, expanded consulting and coaching opportunities in 2024. Alex on my team is working on expanding our abilities there. So if you are working with a company or you're running a company, you want help with Notion, we'll be able to provide that more capably in 2024 or scaling that, uh, that part of my team out. Uh, otherwise, if you just wanna be on my Notion Tips newsletter and make sure you get um, notification when I'm doing new streams, which I'm trying to do roughly on a weekly basis, can't commit to fully weekly because I travel sometimes, but uh, roughly weekly, up in the Learn Notion tab here on Thomas J. Frank, we have this newsletter. Eventually I'm gonna get a newsletter up in the, up in the top men, uh, menu as well, but that'll just take you right there. That'll get you on my Notion Tips email newsletter. And there's a whole bunch of extra goodies, like a whole list of a bunch of the SaaS tools I use. You'll get a list of all of my free Notion templates as well, all kinds of cool stuff. So make sure you're on the newsletter so you don't miss out on future streams, future free templates, other cool content, stuff like that. Lots of cool stuff there. Um, and again, I wouldn't be a good SaaS marketer if I didn't also give a plug for Flylighter. So if you, like me, are somebody who's constantly capturing web clips, uh, highlights from the web, all kinds of cool stuff, you also want a way to easily capture ideas on the go on your phone, Flylighter is the app that we are building for you. It is literally my dream app. It is the best Notion web clipper you've ever seen. It lets you basically fill, uh, create these like custom flows, which will not only capture web pages and highlights or even full articles to Notion, but you can basically set up defaults for the properties in your Notion database. So you could set up a flow that would say like, set a specific tag in your note-taking system, maybe even set a select property. And you could even set it up to grab specific information like the entire property or the entire content of a page or maybe nothing. So you can go in and highlight those pages again. There's a whole demo video on the website so you can see some of our initial features. And we have a huge, like a major new version coming out very, very soon. So you can get on the wait list. We're gonna be opening up a second beta, hopefully next week, and then doing a full launch, uh, probably January, I think unless we can get it out even further than that. Cool, so I think that's like my call to action spiel for the most part. Let me see if there's anything else in the chat in terms of questions. Uh, Shayla says, do you have any recommendations for getting, with getting a team to use Notion more with other applications we use on a regular basis? Um, so I'm not quite sure the context there, but earlier in the stream, which you'll be able to access uh, in the replay at any time you want, we did talk about this whole little mapped out diagram of kind of how we use Notion in the context of other tools that uh, that help with our communication organization. So as a recap, what we do in our company is we have Notion, where we have a company wiki for process docs, reference docs, collections. We also have 
project and task management in there, note taking in there. And then Slack is our team communication area where we have channels like the My Week channel, where we kind of like recap our week and commit to what we're doing in the, in the next week. Um, we have project specific channels where we can easily have uh, real-time conversations about the projects we're working on. And then we have other apps that help with our team organization like Loom for quickly recording screencasts, like Text Expander for sharing text snippets for like customer service and things like that. And then Front, which is our email management platform, which allows me to assign emails to other people on my team for them to take care of, and also allows us to have conversations in the context of email threads in case we need to um, talk about like a customer issue or something like that. So hopefully that answers the question well enough. If it doesn't, um, feel free to tweet me or send me an email and we can cover that in future content. Anything else in the uh, chat here? So I, yeah, I wanna go through Lucia's cool little method for getting an offset date. Um, oh, so yeah, this is actually really clever. Lucia is saying that the manual date takes priority, otherwise it shows the date minus an offset result. So yeah, so basically like you're creating a formula property and you're saying like, if the date property has a manual date, we'll show that. If it doesn't, we create an offset. That's actually quite clever. Um, the only thing that, the only downside to it is it does involve showing two due date properties. So it might even be fun to show that right now. We can create a formula. Call it offset date. Uh, I think we would need a due property for the project. So let's go ahead and create that. Date due. And actually for a project, we need a cooler word than due. So how about deadline? So let's just say the deadline is uh, next Friday. So the offset date for um, get a new rug, we could just say is something like, um, if, and what do we have? Do, if empty, do dot empty, then we would show the uh, project dot map current dot deadline. Otherwise we'd show do. And uh, if we wanted to do deadline, we could do that. We could do like dot date subtract maybe. Or will even let us. Yeah, there we go. Date subtract. Uh, how about like four days? Does that work? So we have November 7th. Cool. So if I get rid of due, what happens? November 10th, which is how many days? Four days? That doesn't seem right. November 10th, November 17th. Isn't that seven days? <laughs> so for some reason, I'm getting. Uh, seven days instead of four, but this is generally what you would do. And I can't tell if I'm just messing up here or if this is a bug, I'm getting the deadline, right? And the deadline should be, let's just check one more time. Let's call this formula, uh, project dot first dot deadline, November 17th. Yeah. Okay. November 17th. Now, why can we not do date subtract? Date subtract one days. We should get November 16th. We do. Okay. So that should be working, but for some reason we're getting project map. What if we do instead of project map, we can do project first, just, just to see. November 10, date subtract four days. I don't know why it's doing that. Uh, yeah, maybe somebody in the chat can see what I'm not seeing here, but I don't quite understand why subtracting four days from our November 17th deadline is giving us November 10th. That doesn't seem to make sense. Or maybe, or am I just like not saying that I have this filled? Oh, that's why. Yep. I'm silly. I just was looking at the wrong row. still had a due date. Okay. Four days, November 13th from 17th. That makes sense. Cool. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to blame that on being three hours into a stream brain fart. All right. Uh, wow. There's, there's still 57 people watching this stream. If you have any more questions, I will all hang out for maybe a couple more minutes. Other than that, we're going to end the stream as a reminder. One more time over on the Thomas Frank explains channel. There is the live tab. And as long as it doesn't destroy my algorithm, which I don't think it should, I'm going to keep all of my streams live as uh, replays there because I think that this is useful context for people who need um, the most in-depth kind of training that I can offer right now, which is streaming, because I get to actually answer questions on stream. 
And then um, what I'm trying to do is take the lessons that I prepare here for stream and the context I get from the chat to uh, create shorter, more compact, long form videos on the videos tab there. So uh, very soon we have basically a super compact version of this live notes dashboard tutorial that is only an hour long instead of three hours. That'll be going live very soon, along with a brand new template called Ultimate Notes. So yeah. And I can only, I can see now, <laughs> now that I decided to look, Marissa is telling me my do wasn't cleared. Yep, I was silly with my formula. Cool, all right. I think that's about it for this stream. So I don't see any more questions in the chat. Thank you as always for hanging out. Next week, I'm planning on doing a pipe dream stream. So to tease that a little bit, pipedream.com is my favorite automation platform for Notion. You can use uh, you can use Zapier, you can use make.com, but pipe dream is the coolest one, the cheapest one, the most powerful one. It's kind of the best in every way. It also allows me to literally like build automations I can share with people that they can just duplicate almost like Notion templates, which is super cool. So next week I'm planning on doing a lesson sort of going through uh, a beginner workflows in pipe dream with no code. And then maybe we'll dip our toes into a little bit of JavaScript code as well. At some point I should have a whole course of materials worth for pipe dream as well. Wow. That's a very interesting way of selecting. <laughs> it just selects over the top. I should maybe tell them about that. Uh, but yeah, it's just a super cool platform. It's what I use to build all my notion integrations and automations. Uh, and I think I did see it maybe one question pop in here. Shayla says, do you trust any certain APIs more than others? Um, that's a good question. I think, uh, you know, when it comes to trusting an API, I would be looking at the security policies of the company behind the API. So in terms of Notion, um, they have well-publicized information about SOC type two compliance and the way they do in encryption at transit and at rest. So um, I don't know if they have like specific documentation on how their API works securely, but I mean, I guess they have they have authentication information as well, uh, but everything else is going to be like, okay, well, if you're submitting a request, ideally it's to Notion database content that they have on their servers. So that's going to be governed by their security policies. So yeah, in short, um, I trust the companies and then I trust the APIs as an extension of the company rather than trying to evaluate an API. Since an API usually is just like a set of tools for working with resources the company already manages. Cool. All righty. Well, that's going to be it. I'm going to go get some uh, lunch. Thanks as always for watching. Make sure you jump on the newsletter right there if you want to get notified for that new stream coming next week. And uh, beyond that, have yourselves a lovely, lovely weekend. Cheers.